Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for your presence. Um, and thank you and welcome everyone also following us online. Uh, welcome to the um, Investing and Financing Resilience and Renewal in Europe, the conference organized by the Bank of Portugal, Bank of Spain, and by the IB. Um, today we have a full uh, agenda ahead of us, as you can, can see. Uh, we'll start by welcoming remarks by um, Professor Mario Centeno, the governor of the Bank of Portugal. And then we'll follow by the keynote speech by Professor uh, Nuno Fernandes. Um, then Laurent Morin from the, um, the head of, country, um, of Economic Studies Division in the Economics Department of the IB. We'll present the conclusions of our uh, investment survey um, with a focus on Spain and Portugal. And then following a, a well-deserved coffee break, We'll have two panels, one where we have the uh, private sector, so with banks and firms uh, highlighting their challenges to financing the green transition. We have two representatives from corporates, Iberdrola and EDP, and also banks, Santander and, and Millennium BCP. And then to close this, this day, we'll have policy panel with um, Mario Centeno, the governor of the Bank of Portugal, uh, Mr. Cos, the governor of the Bank of Spain, Ricardo Mourinho Felix, and it will be shared by Deborah Revortella, the uh, chief economist of the IB. So, without matter much to, to add, I welcome Professor Mario Centeno, Mr. Governor. Well, uh, good afternoon to you all. I'm going to be short. I just want to welcome you here. Uh, this is um, a joint uh, event with the Bank of Spain and the IB. Thank you, Pablo, for being here with us uh, today, Ricardo as well. This is um, a very, I would say, important event in the moment in which uh, we, uh, we, we are, given the challenges that, that we face today uh, in terms of uh, investment, uh, financing conditions, uh, we all care about um, the decisions uh, me and I uh, and, and Pablo uh, take <laughs> in Frankfurt together with uh, uh, a few more people uh, in terms of the monetary uh, policy decisions. This uh, is, of course, a period of tightening in financing conditions. Our economies, especially Portugal and Spain, uh, face uh, very important uh, challenges uh, in that um, situation, given uh, not only the levels of indebtedness that uh, all sectors uh, have in our countries, but also because, uh, I mean, it is quite important uh, at this stage uh, of the business cycle uh, for investment to be uh, as strong as possible. We want to have growth coming uh, from investment, uh, and for that, uh, we need uh, to look uh, carefully to the financing conditions uh, that, that uh, firms, households, and uh, of course also uh, the state uh, face. So uh, I think we uh, have uh, very good prospects for the discussion today. Uh, Bank of Portugal uh, is uh, really uh, keen uh, on, 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 on having and, uh, uh, these, these discussions. Uh, we think uh, it's important um, to uh, look at these uh, investment and financing decisions to be uh, also part of a transformation uh, that uh, I know uh, EIB uh, takes very serious in terms of the digital, the green uh, transitions. Uh, any shock in an economy, uh, at least economists think this way uh, can be used uh, to propel, to uh, enhance uh, transformations. This is probably also uh, going to be the case uh, with, with the challenges we do face today uh, in our economies. Uh, well, that's, that's also part uh, of the, uh, our major concerns uh, here in Portugal, and it will be very clear uh, today. We start uh, already with uh, climate finance, which is uh, uh, a big issue in, uh, in, in, this, in this context. Uh, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to, to the debate. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for coming.
Thank you, Mr. Governor. I would like then to um, welcome, to give a warm welcome to Professor Nuno Fernandes. Um, he's currently Professor of Finance at IES and is sitting in the two institutions or two of the institutions that are today organizing the conference. He's the chairman of the Board of Auditors of Banco de Portugal and is a member of the Audit Committee of the IB and previously was the Dean of Finance at Catholic University in Lisbon and Professor of Finance at the EMD. He has many articles published and books, and most recently he published a book on climate finance, which is, you know, of course, quite a topical event for today. So we look forward to hear your keynote speech. Thank you. Very good. So thank you very much before anything. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you very much for the kind invitation to the EIB, to the Bank of Portugal and Bank of Spain. It's a pleasure to be here with you uh, today. And uh, I'm going to share some, uh, some ideas uh, on climate finance based, uh, as Ricardo said, on, on a book that I have uh, just published on, on this topic. Uh, I mean, summary of, uh, of the talk in case uh, this is after lunch, so I know it's difficult, so I give you the summary right now in case you want to, to take a nap, although I'll try to prevent that. Uh, it's a key topic and there is no option, so we're not going back. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and my view is very simple, is that finance and climate is a two-way street. Finance impacts climate, but climate change also impacts finance. And so this is definitely a key topic for financial players. And besides, investors care a lot because ultimately we're talking about risk return binomial in the long term. Okay, so it's really important for investors and I'll de dedicate some time in my talk to talk about this. Um, second point is that smart companies embrace this and they see this as a potential source of competitive advantage. So it's not just a burden, it's a source of competitive advantage that can distinguish you both as a financial institution or as a corporate if you know what you're doing and you do it well. But of course, as in all change processes that we live through our lives, uh, change and, uh, and transformation brings challenges and brings some difficulties, okay? And so, of course, there are challenges ahead and we have to acknowledge them, but let's not focus only on the challenges, let's focus on, it's really important when we're going to get through this and uh, because it's really about risk, return and long run and sustainability. Um, so what, 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 uh, what, uh, what I'm going to, to basically be sharing with you, this, uh, these ideas basically come from uh, I'm a finance uh, professor and finance academic, so I come from, when I started thinking about this book, uh, which was, by the way, during, uh, during uh, the pandemic, uh, uh, I had nothing to do except doing Legos at home, and so I started writing this book. That's the reason why I wrote the book, no other reason, okay? Uh, I finished all the Lego sets and then start writing the book. And then, and then I thought, I mean, how do I frame this? And I think, okay, finance is about, uh, I mean, you have companies, you have capital markets, and there is something in between which is finance. So I always say finance is the link between demand for capital and supply for capital. And uh, money goes from one to the other, and uh, that's, how, that's how I frame this. So in particular, I look, let me start with the corporate balance sheet. And so what's a corporate balance sheet? On the left, we have the assets. On the right, we have the debt and the equity. So that's how I started the book. It's about, okay, let's see how climate affects the assets. That's one chapter of the book, how climate affects the debt, okay, the, how I finance myself and the different financing possibilities on the leverage side. And then how does climate affect my equity, okay, and shareholders in general? And this is related to um, both public and privately held companies. It's related to corporate governance, to boards of directors, to voting, even to M&As and other things. And this is the starting point. I start with the corporate side and then I move to the capital market side when then I talk, okay, given that I talk about the, the, the demand for capital now, what does this mean in terms of the supply for capital and the different stakeholders around, namely central banks, rating agencies and other players that are facilitators in the process. That's chapters five and six. Um, so the book is really about, I mean, it's really, uh, uh, lots of people help to the book and many of them, I see them here in the, in the room and I want to acknowledge that to start because it had the contribution of many, many uh, friends over time in reviewing chapters and contributing interviews, case studies, lots of case studies uh, people contributed to. And ultimately, I prefer to see what others say, what other people say the book is all about, right? And people say, look, it's about, it's not a single, uh, 
unicided view of the world, rosy, everything is great, and uh, let's just be green because green is great. No, although I'm from sporting, I think green is great, but in this case, we need to be balanced, okay? Uh, sporting, for those of you not from Portugal, is the, Portuguese, the best Portuguese team, and it's green, okay? That's clear, so green is good. Um, and uh, it's also, I mean, it's, it's a book that should be appealing, and the topic, I think, it's appealing in general, to, to corporate officers, but also to people that work in asset management or to in financial markets in general. Uh, and, uh, and I think it's, it's really also about highlighting the, ver the various changes that occur in the finance world uh, that ultimately translate into finance vehicles, finance mechanisms, and, ch and new changes for companies. Um, that's how, how I try to frame the book. And I start with what's the problem, and the problem is pretty obvious what it is, so I'll be very brief on this. There are physical effects of climate change. Um, we know globalization has been occurring and this has brought development all over the world. But globalization also has side effects because at the same time as we get richer, we also consume more and we have a finite world ultimately to live from. Um, so there is a rise in CO2 emissions. We are starting to change, starts with the Paris Agreement and other agreements that happened in the past, and different stakeholders are changing their mindset. So, so this is also about consumers and employees who nowadays are much more uh, prominent in this situation. And employees, clearly, they, they, they look at companies uh, that do things in the right way, in a different way nowadays, and clients the same way. So, I mean, obvious things that we all know, temperatures have been rising, so this is not, no longer subject to discussion, okay? That's, uh, that's part of the problem. Um, what's creating this? Emissions. We know emissions have escalated over the last 50 years. Uh, and this brings consequences like uh, uh, extreme weather events, like, uh, earth, uh, like, uh, like uh, floods or, uh, and other kinds of natural events that happen because of the global warming. And this is, a, is what's called the physical risk. Uh, and brings actually human risk because there are deaths uh, because of, of global warming. There is loss of productivity of mankind all over the world because of global warming and other uh, extreme weather events. So this brings costs and that's why it's in the agenda of CEOs, of investors, and the whole value chain. So rating agencies, advisors, asset managers, wealth managers. Um, also because consumers, either of industrial and services products or of financial products, they do care about this. Therefore, this is a substantially important topic for regulators, banks, and financial institutions. So some examples of, uh, of uh, I mean, the, 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 the appeals that this is an important topic come from both the finance world, from the regulators world, or from the corporate world. Just, just a few statements, uh, but many, many more could be seen. And then we have the politicians that also stepped into this, and we have a global agreement, the Paris Agreement, that is subscribed more or less all over the world and signed in different uh, speeds, of course. Not everybody goes at the same speed, and the compliance is not the same all over the world. We know that. But still, it's ratified by, by almost uh, the entire planet. Uh, and uh, on the corporate side, we see companies reacting and companies wanting to be serious on this, for instance, by joining the SBTI, the Science-Based Target Initiative, which says, look, I'm transitioning to a net zero and I have credible targets because it's very important to be credible. It's not enough to have targets. You have to be credible in the targets you have. Um, so let's start with the basics. Okay, what does this mean, climate effects, and why do companies care? Well, simple. Uh, they care because this is going to affect their, their operations. It's going to affect uh, their assets. Some assets, this is what's called stranded assets, will no longer be useful for some companies. Um, then there are also opportunities. So let's not forget, there are risks, but opportunities. And uh, ultimately, this all translates into valuation effects, uh, which is about risk and investors. So this is just a summary of the different climate effects. I'm not going to go through detail in all of them, but of course, climate affects demand for different products and services, affects relative prices in the economy of products, of goods, but also of, of interest rates and other, other kinds of cost of capital, um, affects capital expenditures. If I have to protect myself and my company uh, against physical risks, I have to invest in adaptation and mitigation solutions. Um, affects my whole supply chain. So this is uh, important to think this is not just about myself as a corporate, my whole supply chain is part of that. And I'll show you some examples of, for instance, of car makers, of, of how this flows through the, the supply chain. Uh, and the effects from the corporate uh, financing point of view ultimately has implications towards my cost of capital. So all of these is, are the possible impacts on, on cash flows and value of companies, and that's why this is a relevant corporate topic. Uh, and there are ways, of course, to, to measure this, and uh, this is work in progress, of course. I'm just showing you one possibility. This is what the EIB uses as the climate risk model, but there are several models, uh, var variants of this model, but ultimately, 
we need to measure the two sources of risk, the physical and the transition risk, and see how we are exposed to it and what kind of mitigation actions we're taking. So exposure and risk management at the same time. So let me go to the first uh, side of the, the, the right-hand side of the balance sheet after explaining this is important for the asset side, then how does the financing world react to this? And this, in a finance audience, mostly in the room, it's pretty quick. It's about, there are lots of fi new financing instruments. We have green bonds, sustainability-linked bonds, uh, green loans, uh, sustainability-linked loans. The rating agencies are stepping in and seeing what's the default rate of a company uh, and how does this change because of climate effects. Um, it's super relevant in project finance of long-term infrastructure projects and in supply chain financing, which is also something very important for financial institutions, just pure financing of working capital of an FMCG company, this is pretty relevant as well. So world uh, bonds, uh, green bonds being issued uh, has been steadily increasing over time, so it's clearly on the rise. We see the same if you look at sustainability linked bonds, so this is clearly a trend that's here to, to stay. Uh, and the point I want to make as well is this is not just about myself, it's about the whole supply chain, because that's what the scope one, scope two, and scope three of emissions is all about. Uh, sometimes many companies, the emissions I do myself is not very relevant. For instance, a bank, the emissions that the bank generates by itself are not very relevant. A bank doesn't burn anything in its facilities normally. Uh, but, uh, but the banks have an impact through their supply chain, and companies the same. And so that's uh, an example of Walmart and some supply chain financing problem uh, program they have. They have, uh, Walmart has uh, thousands or dozens of thousands of suppliers worldwide, and so they figure out, I mean, the products I sell, I may move my stores to, to being uh, with renewable energy or put LED lights or all, all, all that. But I mean, if that's what, the only thing that Walmart does is really window dressing and greenwashing because I mean, the, the big impact that Walmart has in the world is through the products they sell. And so they thought about this and they say, okay, I have to go down to my, my suppliers and then I have to incentivize them to provide me more sustainable products. And the way they do this, for instance, is through the supply chain program, which is they give better financing conditions for the suppliers that meet certain goals, okay? And it's basically give right incentives to people, and if you give right incentives to people, good things uh, pop up. Um, then on the equity side, moving to the equity side, um, it affects lots of things. It affects private equity firms because a private equity firm invests in a company and wants to cash out, let's say, in five years, and they know the value at exit is going to be contingent on whatever is the risk that they're posing to investors. Uh, it's important for family firms, for public traded firms, in M&A setting, uh, and I just want to highlight a couple of things from this topic of equity and shareholders, which is investors can actually drive positive change. Okay? And, uh, and there are lots of options that investors have available in terms of their act, acting possibilities. Um, one uh, simple option is to exit, okay? I don't want to, to do business with brown companies. Uh, I don't want to give uh, any kind of investment to, to companies that uh, are involved in oil, for instance. That's one possibility. Um, what's clear is that exit is not the best way to drive change often, and from many of the literature it says, look, corporate engagement and, and shareholder action, I'm talking about uh, equity holders and shareholders here. Corporate engagement and stakeholder action can even be um, a stronger uh, a force for change than pure exit. And this works through voting and proposals in uh, annual general meetings and works through corporate governance uh, uh, facilities. Um, some numbers behind this. I mean, if you look at the climate-related resolutions in the US, which, as we know, is not at the forefront of this, okay, but it's still pretty relevant in the US, you see the number of climate-related resolutions significantly on the rise. Uh, you see this being used by proxy advisors when they're looking at companies and recommending votes for individual directors in general assemblies. They look at the profile of the company. Um, it's being used by active and passive investment in their, in their, in their decisions of, the, of investment. Uh, which brings to question what's the role of the board? What, do I have the right structure in my board to address these issues? And also problems of executive compensation, because again, incentives are important in order to drive change. So how do we figure out uh, the right executive compensation scheme? And by the way, it's not as simple as put, uh, let me put a target there on an ESG rating, okay? Because uh, as I'll show later on, just targeting an ESG rating level is not a very good system for executive compensation. Uh, but it's uh, thinking carefully about these topics. Moving more to the market side and to the corporate market side. Uh, we have uh, ESG ratings that are appearing and they give us basically an indication as opposed to credit ratings that give us default probability. An ESG rating gives us 
what's the rating of this company on an ESG scale, and many companies are doing this. Uh, we have uh, stock market indices that are being created, and we know stock market indices are super important because uh, uh, the, the passive investors, they track indices. And so if the index is done with the ESG criteria behind, then this is going to drive investments from passive investors. Um, then it's important to think about what's the performance of green products and strategies and, uh, and what are institutional investors doing about this. And I'll show you some evidence of what the different types of investors are doing here in, uh, in a couple of minutes. Um, so first the thing I want you to remember is that investors do care and they're acting, okay? Actively speaking, investors are voting with their money and they, because they do care uh, about the long-term returns and the long-term risks that they're exposed to, many of the long-term investors, including pension funds and sovereign wealth funds with a long-term perspective, they're moving and so are other short-term investors and even uh, other uh, privately held investors like private equity I mentioned before. Um, the sovereign wealth funds, insurance companies, of course, I should mention as well, very important long-term player, uh, and endowments and family offices. All of these are acting and they care, and I'm going to show you just some statistics. So this is the principle for responsible investment, which is basically a, a UN-driven initiative that uh, asset managers or, or investors subscribe to. And when they subscribe, basically they, they sign themselves to certain pledge in terms of the, the, the environmental uh, uh, approach that they're going to take in managing their assets. And now we have more than 100 trillion of investors that have uh, pledged to the PRI. Um, we have stock market indices being created all over the world from MSCI, from the, the stock, from the Dow Jones, from S&P, climate related indices that are being created with thousands of companies using ESG ratings behind often to see what are the best and more credible companies in this. And as opposed to the traditional indices, which are market capitalization weighted, here they're going to be weighted on how sustainable you are. And so if you're more sustainable, you're more likely to have a higher weight in the index and therefore that comes with certain advantages as well. Uh, in terms of investors, how are they looking at this? Well, you have banks, you have non-financial companies, asset managers, pension funds, insurance companies, foundations, family offices, and this chart here shows you basically how they are looking at their uh, ESG policy. And most of them, either they have one or they're implementing one right now. Okay? There are very few uh, or a decreasing share of investors, particularly those that are exposed to financial markets that are saying, uh, we have no intention of doing anything. Um, and the amount of assets that are uh, that are managed with pure ESG targets behind it has tripled over the last uh, f 10 years, eight years. So behind uh, many of these things are ESG rating. And so when we s talk about ESG, we're talking about many, uh, three completely different dimensions. One thing is the environment. Um, the other thing is social impact, the other thing is governance. And so they are interlinked, but they're very different and it's important to recognize the difference between them. When we talk about the environment, which is the one that uh, we're focusing here today and the one I focus in my book, it's about climate change, but it's also about pollution, it's about usage of natural resources like water, uh, recycling policies, things like that. Uh, and now we have to think about, is this, do I care about what the company is doing today or do I care what the company will do five years from now? Because one thing is what the company was doing in the past, the other thing is what the company will do in the future and that has to do with its plans and with its transition. Um, in terms of social goals, there are human capital goals, uh, natural resources and, uh, and different kinds of uh, uh, things and corporate governance is typically divided into things like, okay, you have on the one side more the compliance stuff, more related to corruption and tax and all that. On the other hand, more the traditional corporate governance things related to the role of the board uh, and how the board works and disclosure practices as well. So then we have these uh, agencies that are doing ESG ratings uh, and uh, they're being consolidated. So this is a, a, a market that has uh, popped up over the last 10 years. I mean, it exists for 30 years, but really it's relevant over the last 10. Its consolidation is in progress right now. There are lots of different metrics being used uh, with different methodologies and, uh, and the problem is that they're not always correlated. Okay, that's one fundamental problem. So if you look at the uh, corporate ratings, okay, all of us are familiar with corporate ratings. Let's say Moody's and S&P, they have a 90% market share in, in, in investors' mindset worldwide. 
uh, they have their ratings, okay, and it goes AAA, AA, A, double B, and all that, okay? Uh, and Moody's, uh, they use capital letters, that's the biggest distinction to, 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 to uh, the standard term poor uses capital letters, AAA, AA, A, double B, and then we have junk bonds and, high, and investment grade bonds, and the thing is, a company that is rated AA by Moody's is rated AA by S&P. And I mean, the, the variance between the methodologies is minimal, and it's not possible that one rates you double B and the other one rates you AA. That simply does not exist. Uh, so that's what we're used to in is corporate ratings. Basically, they are the same, and Moody's and S&P are the same. In the ESG world, that's definitely not the case. Uh, in the ESG world, I just show you here some data, for instance, of uh, different, the top ratings, Sustainalytics, uh, Vigo Iris, KLD, and MSCI. And this shows you for a certain company, let's take Intel at the top, uh, it can go from being a, a, a disastrous company to being best performing company, right? Depending on the rating, on the rating company that you use, right? So one company can say I'm a fantastic company, the other I'm, I'm a, the worst company in the sector. Uh, and, uh, and so when you look at the correlation between these different indices given by different providers, in green, if it is a correlation, is high. In red, if the correlation is poor. And what you see is that on average, the correlation is not very high among the different things. If I was going to show you this correlation for credit ratings would be 99.5%. The correlation between corporate ratings of one and the other agency are the same. Here, we have divergence in ratings, which of course allows for a lot of window dressing, right? If I, I can do lots of window dressing, and Intel can do, do lots of advertising based on that rating and, and completely ignore that rating over there if they're interested. So that's on the investor side, okay? And then on the public policy side, there are also several responses in progress. Um, starting, of course, with the most basic uh, traditional economics, cohesion economics, which is about externalities. We have an externality. How do we price negative externalities in this case, and how do we tax? Uh, by the way, we're still giving lots of subsidies to, to industries that are creating carbon emissions, so is it reasonable to continue with the level of fossil fuel subsidies we have, uh, not just in emerging markets, also in developed markets and in Europe. Uh, but there is the transition problem, and transitions, they always bring challenges, uh, for instance, for Polish workers that work in coal mines, and if you close all the coal mines, what happens to those millions of Polish workers? Are they going to be immediately programmers for Amazon? I don't think it's exactly like that. So we have to think about, that's what just transition is all about. There are obviously political, uh, economic aspects involved that have to be taken into consideration. Um, Non-financial reporting, this is also a global thing because it cannot be decided by a single country or single jurisdiction because of course capital is global and therefore reporting has also to have some kind of global framework. Work in progress, we're not there yet. Global regulators in general are working on this but there's still a need for convergence. But I think this is normal in any kind of process. It will converge ultimately. This is a, we are just uh, in the infant stages of, of a process. Um, there is a significant important role for the organizers of this conference, okay? Multilateral development banks like the EIB and central banks. And that's what chapter six uh, basically dedicates its its efforts, so emissions trading systems, I'll skip these subsidies, still peak subsidies to fossil fuels going on around the world. And let me focus more on financial markets related things like, like disclosure. Um, it's, this is where the, the convergence is occurring, but it's not there yet, and, uh, and it's important to, to be uh, aware of this materiality principle, because one thing is mandating disclosure for everybody, but you have to mandate it very carefully, because uh, I don't want to mandate that uh, institutions report something that is irrelevant. For instance, as the example I gave you with the, with the, with the bank, uh, I mean, a bank, I don't want the bank to tell me how many uh, carbon tons did they use, the employees, uh, when they flew around to go to conferences worldwide. I mean, that's irrelevant. The bank carbon footprint does not come from the electricity that we use or from the tra air airplane travel we use. It comes from the clients and the, and the companies we finance. Uh, so this is basically means that, look, if you look at a certain industry, there are certain things that are more important that you have to focus upon, and not all are equally important, okay, in terms of the, the, the KPIs that you should look for. Uh, so that's why this is very different from the, the corporate rating world, because in the corporate rating world, what we care about is default. And default, we know what it is. You, do, you don't have money to pay your, your, your interest or, or your coupon or your principal. That's what default is all about. Here we're talking about many different dimensions, and some companies impact more one dimension, some companies impact more others. And so if you want to get to a good outcome, you have to be very clear on the materiality of the different issues, okay? And there are many different issues behind uh, each company and sector. And of course, this is what I mean with this, is that disclosure has to take this well into account. 
multilateral development banks, this will be discussed later on, so I'll skip this because the, the EIB clearly ahead in terms of their climate uh, finance commitments, but I'll skip this. I'll talk just a little bit about central banks uh, that, uh, as we know, have been, uh, have been uh, increasing their, their importance and the total size of the economy through the different quantitative easing programs uh, around the world. Uh, but uh, they, also, they, also, they also have uh, basically been embracing green activities one way or the other, okay? So this graph shows you the number of investment banks that have adopted some kind of uh, activity, okay? Some are just being members of a network, okay, fine, you're a member of a network, but uh, that's okay. But then are you actually acting on your investment policies? Because investment uh, central banks, they have a very big portfolio. And so how are they investing this big portfolio, right? That's important. Um, and then investment uh, central banks, they also supervise. Often they're also the supervisors of financial sector. And so how are they transmitting uh, good incentives to the institutions that are supervised by them? But you see it clearly on the rise being implemented either in macroprudential policy, on, 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 on disclosure for financial institutions, or in green bond programs and green lending guidelines. Okay, so this is clearly on, on the rise. Um, but of course, this comes with challenges, right? So I mean, most of the book, I would say 80% is about positive things and good developers, non-finance, but there are also challenges uh, ahead, and I'll dedicate the last five minutes of my talk to some of the challenges that will be discussed all over this day, I know. So my starting point is this. Finance has an important role to play, but there are some challenges remaining. Um, there is one important challenge that we must acknowledge and, and, and deal with it, which is the geopolitical challenge and the level playing field. Um, we also need to be careful with greenwashing and making sure that we don't, uh, we don't send the baby away with the bathwater. So we're careful with greenwashing and be very mindful of the transition and that is in any kind of transition there are going to be trade-offs and trade-offs require managerial decision making and, 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 and a careful thought process, thinking carefully about different stakeholders. So for instance, the global transition. Yes, we need to transition to, to, to low fossil fuels and to, to low to renewables, that's obvious, and we need to decrease the carbon footprint of our energy worldwide. Um, now, if you look at uh, what's going on in the world, it's something like this. In terms of fossil fuel, uh, in the OECD countries, uh, we still use around 20% of coal. Um, the majority of the, the, the electricity is generated with natural gas, with nuclear, uh, hydroelectric, and renewables. So let's say renewables, uh, a share of 30%. And then if you look at the uh, uh, outside non-OECD countries, uh, it's significantly less. And coal accounts for like 50% of the, of the consumption of electricity in countries like China and many countries in, in, the, in Southeast Asia. So this is kind of a very, stat I mean, this is obviously, this is a static picture, right? This is in a certain year, how much each country is consuming of coal. And so we can look at this and say, oh man, this, this, this guys, get your act together, right? I mean, get your act together, you cannot use coal, you have to use, uh, you have to put solar panels there. That's, that's okay, but we have to be mindful that uh, this is, a, this is a, a, just a one year snapshot. And, uh, and in a, a one year snapshot, China pollutes much more. Okay, but they're also bigger, per capita, the numbers would be completely different from that. The reason China pollutes much more than the US is because they have six times the population or five times the population of the US. The US pollutes much more per capita in terms of CO2 emissions than China. Uh, by the way, that's valid also for the EU, it's not very different. Um, now, but still, when you look at this, you can say, okay, some countries are really polluting a lot, but I think it's important that we are mindful of where we are and the problem was created basically by uh, not by China, right? If you look at the stock of emissions over the last 50 years, basically that's what creating global warming. Well, I mean, the responsible uh, for the big stock of emissions are us, Europe and the United States for 50% of that. Even though now we're not polluting that much. So we already did our transition and we are on the good track. But so this is one of the big geopolitical uh, and transition things that have, we have to be careful about is to think about uh, flow versus a stock. Then another important uh, challenge is what's sustainable investing, okay? Given what I showed you, just an example of behind the SG ratings, we know it's challenging. There are lots of different words out there. Some people say it's about sustainable investing, responsible investing, SRI, ethical investing, ESG, sustainable finance, impact. So lots of different buzzwords going around. 
uh, what we know is that consumers, they are really eager, right? The interest of consumers for products that really address both their savings, but also with some kind of sustainability footprint is very strong, in particular by those that are going to be the, the owners of assets in the future, because we have transition of assets being done right now from old generations to new generations, as always, and the new generation even stronger appeal for, for financial products that, uh, that, uh, that fit their, their, their need for purpose in life in general. Um, more choice is good. Um, and so this is a huge business opportunity for the industry, right? To cater to this growing demand that consumers are definitely uh, wishing for in terms of their savings and their investment products. Uh, however, consumers, they're also a bit confused, right? Because the, the, first they lack knowledge and they want somebody to explain, but there are too many options and these buzzwords confuse uh, and, and vague definitions, what's, uh, what's ESG, what's not ESG and all these ratings. So this is confusing. Um, some also fear negative performance impact and they say, okay, I may do this, but then I don't have a pension anymore in the future. So do I want to be sustainable, but without a pension in the future? So this is kind of a trade-off that many consumers have. Uh, and they start fearing greenwashing because they saw examples of companies and asset managers uh, promising one thing and doing exactly the opposite. That's, what, that's the danger of greenwashing, is that it destroys the trust in the whole sector and the whole industry because it makes sense that we go into this direction, but if some players abuse and do greenwashing, they're not the only ones that suffer. The whole sector is affected by that. Um, and we have 50 shades of green, right? We have lots of green. So the, the, some people talk about it's chlorophyll green, right? This is really, really the, as green as it gets. And then you have kind of uh, pineapple green and things like that. So what's the more green company? I mean, is it Volkswagen, a company that uh, produces cars that are, um, I mean, or BMW that are, I mean, super, con they consume a lot, they have internal combustion engines, uh, they have uh, huge horsepower, they have great uh, engines that make great uh, noises. Um, but this company has engaged with clear scope three targets to become net zero, um, and they engage and are certified by SBTI. They've decided I'm going to reduce the dependency on raw materials like uh, battery and cobalt and all these rare earth things that we know they're not available just uh, all over the world. They are very concentrated in a few countries. Um, and they decided let's look at the car over the full life cycle and the car we don't just pollute by when we drive the car. The car also pollutes a lot when it's being built and also after the car, uh, its lifetime, it also keeps polluting and we have to see how, or Tesla. So what's the more sustainable company? Most people would say Tesla, super sustainable, right? It's not as clear, right? Although Tesla says it's 100% EVs, it's true, they only do EVs. Um, on the other hand, their components are way, they pollute much more, I mean, it's 60% more polluting than, than BMW or Volkswagen through their supply chain. Um, and then what's built versus what's used, because if you use an electric car and your energy, as I've shown you before, is still made out of coal, I mean, what's the, what's the energy saving that you have there, right? Is the, is the car, the electric car going to do anything if your energy is not uh, green, not clear? Um, and so this is about thinking over the full life cycle. Do we want to be just appear to be green, right? And I'm not saying Tesla is not a good company. I'm saying, look, we have to be very careful and not just judge at the surface and say, okay, electric cars are great and BMW cars pollute a lot. Not necessarily. Think about the full cycle. Think about now and future use and think about the whole lifetime of products and services. And it's not as clear cut sometimes what's the more green company unless you start doing your job correctly. So the EU is acting in this way, and the, the EU action plan is basically to see how can we come across with coming with terms that are reliable and standard and that everybody follows the same plans. That's what the EU taxonomy is all about, is to come to uh, names for industries and, and activi economic activities that we all understand, that we all uh, can use for labeling funds, for labeling uh, stock market benchmark indices, to understand what's a green bond or not, right? We need to understand what's a, what's a green bond or not, and also to say what should companies disclose. So this is the, the, one of the important uh, things that are going on uh, to try to prevent uh, greenwashing. But I, I'd highlight again, greenwashing is a big problem, which is the fundamental problem is what you say versus what you do. Okay, that's what greenwashing is all about. You say you're green, but you, what you do is brown. Um, 
And there are lots of false claims that were done in the past by corporates, okay, uh, that issued green bonds and then you go and look in detail and they use the green bonds for dirty projects uh, for asset managers um, and asset owners, okay. And so the SEC, for instance, last year they came up with a, a review of ESG investing and they went through the big uh, asset managers in the US, uh, actually two years ago, and uh, and they basically found uh, some some scary things like uh, not okay, not precise ESG definitions, of course, pose some risks. But besides that, uh, the, it creates confusion with consumers and there's certain abuse being done in terms of marketing of some asset managers that they appeal to consumers who's using wrong terminology and wrong uh, definitions. Um, and then they also don't act the way they say. They say, I'm going to do a policy portfolio that, does, that acts this way and then they vote totally inconsistent with what they promise to their consumers. Um, and, uh, and basically they were, I mean, this is basically what, uh, what the ECC has found in many different dimensions. But this is just an example of in the financial world, let's say, one possibility for greenwashing. In terms of financial institutions and lenders, there are lots of risks of greenwashing that we must uh, try to prevent in the future. Um, for instance, it's always the difference between what you say versus what you do, but I mean, you, you, you may have fantastic ESG reports and uh, with lots of uh, colors and all that, but then if you're, you're still doing brown portfolios and brown loans, uh, are you really green? Um, are you serious in challenging in the KPIs you use in sustainability linked loans? Because one thing is that I help companies issue sustainability linked loans, it seems great and goes on the league tables. The other thing is, are you really going for challenging but reasonable KPIs when defining those loans. Because if you're not, you're just putting a label on a product, but uh, you're just abusing of the label and destroying the whole confidence in this, in this sector. Uh, at the same time, we must be mindful that we must finance the transition. And, and, so, uh, and to finance the transition means we don't go from zero to one in a single day. So we have to see how we get there. And so th that requires financing as well for the transition. In closing, it's a two-way street. Finance impacts climate, climate impacts finance. Uh, smart companies, source of advantage. Finance has an important role to play. Investors care. It has important governance implications for top managers, regulators, and boards. Um, and the transi transition challenge brings managerial trade-offs, but that's what uh, managers and regulators and top boards are there for, is to solve these problems. Thank you very much. So I don't know if we have time. I don't know if take questions or not. What's the, the idea? Yeah, questions? I don't know if there are questions. But... No? All right. So, David? Any questions? We have time for one or two questions, perhaps? Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Um, no time for a nap, at least for myself. It was quite interesting. Um, next, my colleague, Laurent, uh, will present the main conclusions from the IB Investment Survey for Portugal and Spain with a focus on the EU perspective. So, thank you, Laurent. Can I get the presentation from? Okay, anyway, uh, thank, you for, thank you for hosting the event, Banco de Portugal. Thank you for co-organizing with us, Bank of Spain. And I'm Laura Morin. I'm head of the Economic Studies Division in the Economics Department of EIB. And I'm going to guide you through a set of slides about the investment outlook, the challenges that are faced, that uh, European and Spain and Portuguese investment face in the near future and on, in the transition towards a greener economy and more digital economy. So hopefully we manage to get the slides. Otherwise, so we wait a bit. I, I can tell you a bit that the VIB we monitor invest in the economics department we monitor investment for helping supporting the design of European policies toward higher investment. And we have various products that we distill. Uh, the investment report, which is the annual re report that we have, on which I'm going to base my presentation. And, uh, and VIBIS, which is a survey of 12,500 corporates that we conduct annually, and based on which we do a lot of analytical uh, analyses, uh, studies, in order to see the impediments and the, 
and the push for investment. So what can support or what can impede investment, especially in the domain of green and uh, digital investment. We are there. So it's consistent with what I said. So you can see the various products, so the inv investment report and the EIBIS fishes, and for each country, each EU countries, of which uh, Portugal and Spain naturally, we have a more focused analysis of the investment situation in the, in the country. So I'm going to have the presentation sur, uh, structure around four main uh, components. The third component will be about overall investment with a focus on corporate situation, corporate investment. The second component will be about energy crisis and uh, green transition, green investment. The third one will be about digital transition and the way it can support the green transition. And then I will end up my presentation, which will be relatively short, uh, with the need to leverage on uh, public investment, as well as to tackle some structural impediments in the corporate ecosystem to foster investment. The first one, regarding the overview on investment, is very key to bear in mind, and this is the European picture, it's very key to bear in mind that over the last 10 years, there, there has been a substantial gap between European investment and, and American US investment of around two percentage points each year since since the GFC, since the global financial crisis. And the gap has not, has not narrowed, it has not widened, it has remained constant. And this is an impediment for TFP, for capital deepening, and for long, for long term economic growth in the European Union. The second thing, and this is the chart in the middle, is about the investment in innovation which is done by European corporates. It's, it's going down, sadly and it's well below the ones that we see in the US, and we know that we have problems to catch up in, term, in some sectors with the capacity of innovation of the US economy. And the first slide, the first chart, the third figure that you see on this slide is about the investment needs which are required to operate the green transition. So this is derived from the simulation which are operated and conducted by the European Commission, the GNR. And you see that investment which are, which are uh, historically dedicated to energy and uh, and uh, electricity need to be boosted substantially in order to operate the green transition and we really speak about sub substantial amounts to, to be injected in the, the economy system there. So then I go to the situation over the most recent history in the EU and in Portugal and in Spain and there I have three charts. Overall what you have to bear in mind is that the investment in the EU, real investment in the EU is above pre-COVID, slightly above pre-COVID. So the downturn in COVID has been uh, recovered, but there is a lot of diversity in the EU overall, and, uh, and also between Portugal and Spain, as you can see on the chart on the left, uh, Spain is not yet back to pre-COVID level, while Portugal is substantially above, and this is true for total investment, but even more so for corporate investment, which is the chart in the middle, and the charts are in real terms. And this doesn't bode well, because we know that uh, since the start of the monetary policy tightening implemented in the euro area, uh, since last summer, uh, the monetary policy tightening is passing through corporate cost of borrowing, corporate cost of bank borrowing, and if anything, you have a steep rise in the cost of borrowing for corporates, and therefore it will be too cost more costly, it, it is already more costly to finance investment, so it doesn't bode well for investment overall in the EU and in Portugal and in Spain. Then I turn to a more positive picture, which is given by the internal capacity of financing investment, so the profits of firm. And as you can see, uh, on the left hand side, you have the profit markup indicators, profit margin indicator, which is uh, deployed based on Eurostat data. There is a recovery in the three, in the two countries as well as in the Europe. Steep recovery. And this is consistent with the pictures that we get from the IBIS, so the surveys that we conduct annually, which shows that in fact, most of the corporates have recovered their earnings of pre-COVID. And uh, some are lagging in some specific sector and some specific countries, but overall the recovery is there and it's something, even uh, some corporates record high profit, profit rates above 10% of uh, a turnover. Then I move to the energy crisis and the green transition. And the first thing to have in mind when you look at this slide is the fact that overall, more or less, uh, the, the three main components of energy, which are coal, oil and gas, the prices of this three main component is, all, is a bit higher, but close to be back to pre-crisis, pre-energy crisis level. It's something that you can see in dollar on the chart on the left-hand side. 
At the same time, this was the same shock for European companies, but it propagated very asymmetrically throughout the ecosystem in Europe in the sense that the sources of energy differ across European countries, the, the fixing, the pricing of energy differ. So for the same international shock, the propagation within European economies was very diverse, was very different. And this is true in terms of change, as you can see on the chart on the left. So there was a wide dispersion in the y-axis uh, in terms of price change, but this is also structurally true in terms of level with a lot of diversity in, uh, in the average price of energy for corporates in European economies. And in fact, energy crisis has been passed through to corporates and corporates have been concerned a lot by the rise in energy costs. And as you can see on the chart on the right, the chart is produced based on our survey, energy price has become a major concern for many corporates in Europe. So this is structurally true in more, than in, more in Spain and in Portugal than in the rest of Europe. But over the recent past, over the recent year, we have seen a spike in the level of concern due to energy costs in Europe, in these countries, given what we have seen on the international scene. Does this have impact is changes on the, on the corporate behavior, on corporate investment? Yes. First of all, before answering this question, it's good to bear in mind that the transition, the climate transition, is assessed very differently depending on corporates. Some see it as an opportunity. It's what you can see on the, on the green bar on the left hand side, which is reported at you. Some see it as neutral and some see it as a risk. Okay? And it's more, more, more or less uh, similar in Spain, Portugal and EU as a whole. Then we have to dig further at the sectoral level. But overall, some companies see the climate transition as an opportunity, but some see it as a risk, and the bulk of them see it as neutral. Is what they do is consistent with what they, what they assess, what they perceive, yes, in a way that, in fact, the share of, fact of climate active firms, which is reported on the chart on the right, which is a synthetic indicator of various questions that we have regarding energy investment, is going up. So, and this is true in Spain, in Portugal, and in the EU. And in Spain, it's going up even more, given that the risk is assessed to be higher in this country, the physical risk being, being assessed to be higher, given the, the warming, especially pronounced in this country. So overall, companies are concerned about climate. They integrate climate in their investment behavior more and more. Is it sufficient? Uh, we know that it's not sufficient, and we know that the public intervention is needed to, to solve the issue. But another component which can be leveraged on in order to solve this issue is digitization. Why so? because digitization and innovation, because this is a key component of the, of the capacity of the economy to, to manage better energy and to find new sources of energy or new sources of producing while being more energy efficient. And this chart, this slide is about how the, the green transition can go in tandem with the digital transition. What you see is that the countries where uh, uh, firms digital more are, are also the country where firms do more in terms of climate actions. It's true for all the three indicators. Uh, reduce uh, CSG emission, uh, tackling climate change, or planning to, tack to tackle climate change in, with investment. In, in the three cases, in the, three, in the four economic area, or the four countries or region, you see that the firms we, which do digitization also do more climate, climate, uh, climate investment. So it's very key to, to do more digitalization in order for firms to do more climate investment. And what we see is that uh, the share of firms being advanced in digitalization, okay, we have various components uh, again in the survey for assessing this, so this indicator which is reported on the left. What you see with this indicator is that Spain is performing above the EU average, according to this indicator, and even above the US economy. And Portugal is recently performing less below the EU average. But overall, the, what, I, what is to bear in mind is that firms invest more and more in digitization. They have taken the benefits of COVID to digitalize further because they realized that this was the only way to survive with the crisis. And the chart on, in the middle is about the consistency of these indicators that we have built with the indicator which is more uh, known from the European Commission, which is the DAISY index the Digital Economy and Society Index compiled by uh, services of the Commission. So this, this indicator is quite consistent, it's quite uh, correlated with the, with the more known uh, indicator. And when we correlate our indicator with the share 
digital capacity of uh, of the of municipality of uh, of the local the, the local the local provision of digital services where firms operate you see that there is a clear correlation between the way they do digitization and the quality or the intensity of digital at the municipality level. So this is also a result that we get from the survey, which means that in fact, public provision of digital capacity act as a, spill, as a catalyzer for corporate digitization. And with this link, I will go to government investment and the need to be cautious about government investment. So we all know that following the global financial crisis and especially the sovereign debt crisis, there was, especially in countries from the south of Europe where the crisis was more pronounced, a slump, as you can see on the chart on the left hand side, of, um, a substantial decline in the share of public investment in GDP. This is what you can see on the green line on the chart on the left hand side. And we know how painful it is to recover and we know how detrimental it was for economic activity, economic growth in the, in the years after the crisis. This time, we have less concern following COVID about public investment, but we still have to bear in mind that we live in a world where APP is still active in terms of reinvestment. So ECB is still active until June or July. The rise in sovereign spread has been relatively contained so far, has been relatively orderly, and the fiscal rules are not yet re-implemented, but are going to be re-implemented. And in fact, what you can see in the chart in the middle is that the forecast which is entailed in the commission services, which is uh, consistent, I guess, with the, I'm, I, I'm sure, consistent with the plan of the fiscal authority in Portugal, this forecast entail a big uh, decline in public investment share uh, of investment in GDP in Portugal and as well in Spain. And well below uh, with a gap of close to 80 basis points compared to the European Union average. So it's very important to bear this in mind. There are risks on public investment, the same way that there are risks on corporate investment, but for different reasons. This risk at the current juncture is somewhat weak, cautioned by the fact that we are deploying the RRF. So the financing of uh, Europe is very important to support public investment. But at the same time, it's also bigger given that we see bottlenecks in terms of delivering on investment, public investment, given some structural impediments. And these structural impediments are partly related to the availability of skilled staff or to regulation administrative red tape, as you can see on this chart. So this chart is about corporate investment. So it's about firm investment, private investment, not anymore about public investment, but you can infer from it, and we do it in the report, we explain more at length why we do so, the fact that there are some bottlenecks, structural bottlenecks, on which besides the support to public investment, uh, policymakers should have to work in order to really foster investment in Europe. And with this, I conclude my, my presentation. So I show you that investment recovery is uneven across European countries. It's fueled by the profit rebound, which is quite strong, but it is at negative risk given the slowing down in domestic and overall demand and the financial tightening operated by central bank. Along the green transition, investment need to, be, to rise to, to go further in order to support climate change and digitization. As the two interact, I show you this in the presentation. I also show you that firms are transforming and are, per, and are perceiving the need to transform at a higher pace. So they are more climate concerned and they do post-COVID digitization. But public investment is also a clear catalyzer. I show you the case of digitization, but we have many other cases. And this component, public investment, is also surrounded by negative risk. It is at the current juncture very key to support public investment, to, to, to caution public investment, and to remove structural investment impediments that we can see from our survey. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Laurel. Um, now we're going to have a coffee break of 20 minutes as initially scheduled. So um, I would ask, since we are a bit behind schedule, to be 20 minutes sharp. So for everyone to be around back at four. Thank you.
estratégia global. Parece bem. Bom, então, vou começar a Finalmente, I know now we're going to have the private sector um, view on the finance needs to finance the green transition. Uh, the panel is going to be shared by Nuna Spears, the head of EIB operations uh, in Portugal. And we have representatives from EDP, Iberdrola, um, Millennium BCP, and some Santander as well. So like both energy and the financial sector. So Nuno, and then for you. Good afternoon, uh, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. Um, the, the topic of this uh, panel discussion uh, is financing needs of banks and firms. Uh, to support uh, the green transition, uh, resilience, and uh, digitalization. Uh, we have heard about the importance and the challenges of um, uh, uh, green finance and ESG uh, policies. Um, and I will start uh, with uh, Susana Bernardo, uh, Director of ESG and Green Finance at Santander, uh, with a question uh, precisely about uh, uh, the policies. Um, and the question is, well, Santander does have uh, ESG and green finance policies. Um, how do we integrate, do you integrate, include these uh, strategies within the global uh, strategy of uh, Banco Santander? Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation in the name of uh, uh, Santander. Uh, I think it's very important we have the, this, these conversations and putting definitely uh, the, the management of the climate and environmental risk in the agenda. So uh, uh, Santander, for Santander, uh, uh, besides being a, a major market demand and uh, an opportunity, uh, is a must, it's a responsibility, has a responsible ranking. I think this is, uh, and Santander also, the, this is a major transformation in our societies, uh, perhaps much bigger than the digitalization. We, we have uh, uh, the digital revolution, and so uh, we need the efforts of everyone in, in this. Uh, banks uh, obviously have a major role uh, in the economy, but also governments and, and supervisors, and the society obviously uh, uh, in. Um, as you, <laughs> this is in our strategic plan, our mission, our main mission is help people and business to, proper, to prosper. So uh, the green finance and the sustainable finance is in our uh, agenda. One of the pillars is the climate agenda. And uh, as someone says one day, uh, what you don't count or what is countless, you cannot, uh, it, it doesn't exist. So uh, we have put uh, two targets. Uh, one is to promote uh, financing and we have a set a goal for 2025 of uh, uh, delivering finance uh, in uh, about 120 mil billion and uh, for 2030, uh, 220 billion uh, euros. So this is our uh, commitment and our target uh, in helping the, the, the customers uh, in the green transition. And another one is to have uh, net zero by 2015, not only the, our own emissions, because we have uh, um, addressed that issue, but also uh, of our customers. At the, in the future, we, uh, our, our uh, value uh, is our assets and our customers, and if our customers are not green uh, we, and sustainable, we are not sustainable as a, 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 an entity. Um, how are, are we doing uh, that? We have empowered the organization. We have created a global unit that is a green finance uh, division. Um, that division is, is, is set up in the several countries and the major uh, goal is to execute this strategy and deliver the, the, the targets and the commitments we have uh, publicly uh, announced. Um, we have some areas of specialization uh, that are the, the, the potential uh, sectors of the economy uh, that uh, need more help. Uh, we, we are talking about energy and have solutions for, for energy. As a matter of fact, we have a partnership with NDP uh, to, to, to finance uh, solar panels to our customers, uh, corporate customers. 
Uh, the other one is uh, uh, mobility and to finance uh, uh, mobility, not only uh, electric vehicles for individuals, but also to, to companies that produce uh, uh, buses and, and other kind of vehicles. Um, also, the circular economy is very important uh, in the industry and uh, in the sectors that, like uh, water and waste management. Um, we, we are trying to impose that. Also, uh, the sustainable agriculture uh, and to, to help our, our clients to, to, to do that, uh, major uh, in energy efficiency and water uh, uh, management. Uh, also, uh, 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 and finally, the green building. Uh, this is a, a major challenge, uh, not only for, for companies, but also for individuals, because uh, we have our portfolio uh, at about 50% <coughs> uh, are mortgage. So, uh, and the majority of our mortgage uh, is uh, of buildings that are not uh, in the top of the, 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 the efficiency uh, uh, levels that we want to obtain. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, green transition is also about uh, a fair uh, and just transition and we have to, to know that we have some vulnerable uh, population that uh, uh, have more difficulties to, to access um, uh, to the financing. Uh, finally, we, we also uh, are not just uh, worried about the financing, but have uh, a, global, uh, a general framework that uh, uh, to, think, to do things uh, well and address some uh, issues like uh, communication and training, because all the organization, business, uh, second lines of defense, supporting uh, uh, areas and uh, uh, the organization must be aware of these issues and must know some uh, some some things are uh, have uh, some complexity so uh, this is new for the majority and we must uh, uh, empower uh, the whole organization the other thing is to have a, a framework to address to tag the operation to, to identify the green operations from the start and to gather the evidence that justify the tagging and in order to avoid the greenwashing uh, uh, and have uh, covered all the, the, the workflow. And also to have uh, specialists, uh, major in, uh, the majority in risk, uh, to evaluate operations and to uh, have uh, the confidence that we are uh, doing the things in a proper way. So I think the, the, the um, I addressed the question. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much, Susanna. You, you mentioned that uh, Santander stands ready to support uh, your clients to meet their the targets in terms of transition, uh, a green transition and uh, uh, net zero emissions. Now, uh, do you see um, a demand, uh, clients asking for uh, ESG and green finance uh, products? And if yes, uh, which ones? and uh, whether this is more, say, driven by demand or supply or a combination of both? Well, it's a combination of both. I think the, um, in companies we have two, two realities, the, the households and the individuals and uh, the, the companies. I, in the companies, uh, the major companies are much aware of this. If you look through uh, our major companies, EDP, uh, Sonai, Galp, etc., they have uh, uh, their own plans of transition. I think the, 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 the effort will be in the small companies uh, and in the SMEs. We have, uh, uh, and it has to do with uh, the resources those companies have, and uh, in that the banks has a major role as advisors, not just providing financing, but has also as advisors uh, to, to uh, uh, talk to the customers about that, to see what are the better solutions uh, and to advise the customers in, the, in, the, in that way. And in the, in the, in the households, uh, the, the, the challenge will be the more vulnerable uh, uh, populations and, uh, and that has to do 
um, also with the increase of the interest rates and more difficult to get uh, uh, kind of uh, families to access financing in order to retrofit or to improve the energetic efficiency of the, uh, of the, uh, of the houses. But uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's very important to uh, know the customers. Uh, I think uh, now more than ever, the, the customer relationship is very important. And being close to the customers, know the business of the customer, know the risks, and help uh, the customers in, in that uh, a part of financing them and helping them with, with, with that. Thank you very much, Susanna. Um, we continue with the, with the banking sector. We move on to BCP. Uh, Millennium, uh, Jean Miguel Pisania, executive board member, who has a, a, a presentation, a short presentation. Yeah, a short presentation. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here, and uh, I think it's a, a great subject to talk. And uh, um, we are we are very proud of uh, being here presenting. Uh, our thoughts in, in this topic that is uh, of clear importance to, to, to the financing system and to the, to the world in general. Um, I think it's, it's clear for everyone that uh, businesses are, are changing. Uh, some of these changes were already uh, explained by, by Nuno in the previous talk. Um, I, I stress here that there are uh, other factors besides the climate, the climate uh, uh, changes that are driving this uh, quick uh, adjustment of, uh, of uh, uh, our, our uh, customers. There are these uh, geopolitical challenges, uh, the macro environment uh, changes very quickly, as, as you know. There is this very important uh, technological disruption where uh, the, the, the business models are, are, are changing and moving and uh, Companies that don't adapt uh, uh, don't, uh, don't uh, stay too long. And there is also a very important changes in the way uh, stakeholders uh, see the companies, uh, these uh, social changes that uh, are uh, making more difficult to uh, sustain uh, and retain uh, talent uh, to, to, um, you know, to make sure that uh, we have uh, uh, the, the, the right concerns with the well beings of, uh, of our employees and, uh, of course, uh, shareholders, uh, regulators, all that. So, this, uh, this world is uh, changing so quickly that uh, uh, I believe it is clear that uh, banks must, uh, must uh, also change. We have uh, um, you know, to change in order to be more sustainable, of course, but uh, also in uh, supporting these uh, transitions. Uh, as I said, not only the climate transition, but also all these uh, uh, sudden changes that uh, uh, corporates are, are facing. And we have to, to change the way we see risks. You know, we, ha we are going from um, um, an experience, uh, you know, a tradition, I would say, of uh, judging uh, the, the, the projects, judging the, the investment opportunities, judging companies through cash flow, through the capacity of generating uh, cash flow, to uh, include other topics, and uh, for, for easy reference, I, I, I include these topics in the, in the ESG uh, world. But they affect companies uh, either through capital, through uh, liquidity, and uh, mostly through uh, reputation, which is a very important resource for any, any entity, in particular uh, financial entities. And this can uh, affect the way we measure create risk uh, through the calculation of uh, probabilities of default, uh, uh, loss given default, when the customer uh, enters into, into default, what, what we may lose. Uh, it is clear that there are very important connections, but uh, the, the, the way we see it is not uh, just to focus on, uh, on uh, uh, environmental aspects, but include on this judgment other ESG aspects. And the uh, questions like, uh, um, how we are addressing uh, diversity or general equality in, in the company, uh, how uh, the company is uh, uh, progressing towards a more uh, climate sustainable um, uh, way of working, how governance is organized. This is uh, clear topics that typically don't come in, a, in, a, in the traditional, in the traditional um, uh, credit assessment 
but are becoming more and more important. And uh, uh, we are progressing in that way. At the same time, we, we judge companies through an internal rating that measures their capacity to, to generate cash flows and pay the credit. We are also at the same time addressing companies by uh, um, uh, assessing them on the SG front, giving them uh, um, an internal rating, uh, an internal ESG rating that will enable the bank to take better decisions in this, uh, in this front with all these aspects together. I think it's, it's clear that uh, uh, information is a key element, uh, and this is uh, something that uh, almost everyone is working. Uh, Nuno uh, referred the number of initiatives, the number of uh, you know, companies involved, institutions involved. Uh, um, everything is working on providing better information, not only for companies, but also for who manage the risks. Uh, um, at the level of each is institution, but also the, the macro prudential risks. Um, it is easy to say that uh, being in uh, Lisbon is very dangerous from a physical, a physical, uh, a, a climate physical point of view, because we are near the river, we had an earthquake and so on, but uh, it's much more difficult to judge uh, the, 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 the physical risks of a given collateral or uh, physical risks of a given, a given company. And by the way, there is a very good article in the, the, the recent uh, um, uh, financial stability re report of Bank of Portugal, exactly in trying to measure, you know, name by name and not by sector or by, by region, the, 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 um, the risks of, uh, of uh, 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 the companies that uh, are funded by Portuguese banks. But there are more. We face these complex taxonomies. I don't know how many people in the room read the taxonomies. I read, of course, but uh, um, I don't know who uh, 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 understood the, the, those taxonomies. I, I also uh, see credit, uh, much more longer credit that, uh, of course, creates additional, additional tension in uh, approving a credit with uh, 20 years, 30 years than the normal investment uh, horizons of five years or seven years. Um, we don't know exactly how to judge the transitions that the people are saying that are doing. Say a company that we that present a, 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 an investment opportunity, a, a, an investment project that will want the bank to, to, to finance. It's very difficult for the banks to judge, you know, the opportunity, the, 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 the um, if, if that is the right way to, the, to go, etc. Is there is a lot of things that. Uh, we have to think about uh, new things to think about when judging this uh, type of, uh, of elements. And also there is this question of the balance between the E and the, and, and the S. It's very important. Uh, uh, it was also men already mentioned the topic of uh, you no know, miners in Poland, but miners exist in Mozambique. If we take mining from the, the Mozambique portfolio, there's nothing left. In Poland there are other opportunities, but uh, we have to, to, to think about when we are in, uh, say, in, the, in uh, Frankfurt, you know, imposing uh, expectations on the, the way uh, banks manage risk, that there are also the S involved, and the S is, uh, for me, extremely important. I think that uh, every bank is now publishing some kind of principles of responsible financing and so on, but uh, uh, it's uh, much more important than saying no to say a careful yes, a, a, an informed yes, and something that we believe it will pay at the end. That's the reason why I think you know, the, 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 the link with the uh, uh, public entities is very, very important. Uh, um, at least on the first phase, before the banks have the, you know, the capacity to judge, to, to build these uh, this, uh, new visions on, uh, on, the, on, the, on credit, on uh, operational risk, etc. It's very important to share risks with these uh, public entities. It's very important to have their advice on the uh, projects that uh, their, their stamp, you know, uh, on projects that they think are important for the evolution and, uh, uh, and also to uh, make sure that uh, uh, information is provided and uh, understood on the, right, on the right way. This connection with these entities is clearly something that we see as uh, 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 a step. I, I, I don't believe that uh, um, we'll, we'll manage these transitions by imposing additional Pillar 1 uh, capital requirements for banks. This is not the way to go. This is much more a Pillar 2 issue, the way we handle the, the risks. 
and, uh, and I think that uh, the public sector should also uh, do uh, their own part, uh, not by uh, you know, placing all the, all the, all, all the burden on the, on the, financing, uh, the, the financing system, but uh, by uh, helping the financing system to understand better the, the situation. And finally, uh, this, uh, this uh, short uh, uh, wrap up, uh, again saying that uh, business assessment uh, is more difficult, there are uh, um, more dim dimensions to be considered, you know, um, um, a company that is not well prepared to take uh, you know, cyber risk is not a, a, a good company to finance, nothing to do with climate. There is, of course, also the, the, the pressure and the, the additional the additional risks that the bank face that may uh, decrease our capacity to lend and the, the capacity to provide funds for, for the transition and, and for, very important, I think the sponsorship and the, the risk sharing with the public entities is crucial for the banking system to have time to adapt and to do the, the, and take the right decisions without jeopardizing the financial stability. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Um, we have seen how important ESG and uh, uh, the environment and also cybersecurity are important mm -hmm. uh, for BCP. Now, uh, getting back specifically to, to climate risks, um, uh, the question is, uh, how are climate risks integrated within BCP's overall um, uh, risk management strategy and whether the, uh, the strategy and or policies are the result of uh, regulatory changes, uh, pressure from stakeholders, or uh, the own initiative of BCP, or perhaps a combination of, 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 uh, uh, of all of these uh, uh, elements? Uh, very quickly, I, I think that, uh, uh, you know, starting by, by the last question and the type of pressure we have, I think having the uh, clear expectations from the supervisor is a, a, very, go a very good tool. And uh, the, the guide, the climate uh, risk guide that uh, was provided by the European Central Bank is a, a, a very good tool and the pressure they make in uh, 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 ensuring that the banks are progressing in that way is also, is also very important. So uh, I see this as a, a part of the process, uh, part of the, you know, the, the support that the central bank should give to, to, the, to the banks uh, in, in going in the, in the right direction. In terms of risk, we tend to, to, um, to include, to treat these climate risks not as, as a risk per se, because climate risk is not, you know, in our uh, risk, it doesn't uh, affect directly the, the bank, but as a risk factor, as many other risk factors. And the most important one, for sure, is the macroeconomic risks that, uh, that uh, uh, are in the environment that, you know, companies and our customers uh, um, uh, work and progress. So we tend to see the climate risks as risk factors, not in our risk taxonomy, they are not uh, risks per se, but they are able to influence our credit risk, our operational risk, etc. So what we do typically is uh, um, to uh, internally assess, uh, uh, make a, a sort of materiality assessment, trying to see how the different risk types are, uh, are uh, modified by our views on the, on the, on the, climate, on the climate factors. So both the, the transitional risks and the physical risks, how they impact, for instance, uh, operational risk or credit, which are the more, the more exposed uh, type of, uh, of, uh, of risk. For, for, uh, as, a, as an example, of course, on the, on, the private, on the credit to private individuals, it's very important to understand the location of the collateral, the location of the, of the, the residents that we are financing, because this, of course, influences the, our decision for a company, as it was uh, you know, shown by Bank of Portugal in the, in the financial stability report, is important to understand where are the most important uh, facilities of, of the company, where they depend mm -hmm. critically, and if they are or not in a a critical um, physical risk area. So these type of uh, uh, drivers are being uh, considered to uh, assess uh, where the, the, the material, the, 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 the climate risk factors are material or not for the bank and change materially the risk that we, we already face. And the rest is uh, uh, as, uh, business as usual. We are you know, modifying the, the governance for 
uh, addressing these risks, but through the same uh, type of uh, um, the same type of committees, the same type of channels, with the same type of obligations as uh, as we have uh, for any other risk. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have listened from uh, the banks about their the views on on uh, um, uh, the subject of this this, this panel. Uh, we now move to the industry, and uh, we have the privilege of having. Uh, representatives of two leading Iberian and global uh, energy companies, uh, Iberdrola and EDP. Um, and the questions that I would pose is the same to, to the two. Um, the first one is, uh, uh, within your uh, current uh, investment plans, what is the share of, of green investments? Uh, the second part of the question is whether financing constitutes a constraint uh, to new uh, green investments. Okay, thank you very much. I try to, to uh, I am in charge of the financing and treasury of Iberrola. Then I think that is, uh, I mean, we, we are in, in the, with the responsibility to finance the investment. Let us start saying great thanks, thank you very much to the organization, European Investment Bank. We have a lot of relation from, I don't know, probably more than 30 years ago, we started to work with the uh, European Investment Bank, thanks to the Bank of, the Bank of Spain. Bank of Portugal, and I am totally agree with uh, Professor Nuno when he say this is the moment not to say to do. Probably Iberola, beside the transformation 20 years ago, Iberola is a, is a Spanish company founded probably more than 100 a year, but 20 years ago we decided that we, we need to change totally the, the strategy and to try to I mean, be in a, a sector that we have a lot of to do decarbonizing the, the economy, because we, we had a possibility to electrify the economy, we decided to change totally. Probably in this moment it's obvious, everybody speak about the, 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 the sustainability, the, the carbon, these kind of things, but 20 years ago probably it was not so obvious. We started to invest, to close the, the fuel plants, to close the coal plants, and to invest. We have invested from that date uh, more than 120 billion euros in renewables and more than in renewables, also in networks that is necessary to I mean, to use the renewables source of production. In this moment, we are the leading, uh, uh, the first leaders investor worldwide in renewables. We are not a Spanish company, we are an international company with the majority of our business out of Spain, USA, UK, Portugal, uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, and we are the, fe the first uh, produ uh, wind producing the, in Europe, United Kingdom, in Spain, and in USA, third in, U in USA. And where we are, I mean, we, uh, we have a little strategic plan in last year. Last year it was not a, an easy year to decide investment, if I mention. And uh, we, we, uh, in that moment we decided to reaffirm our strategy of invest, invest, invest in renewables, in networks, try to electrify the, the economy. Because apart from this uh, uh, carbonization problem, we had the supply problem. We had a problem to supply electric energy because of the, the war that we had in, in Ukraine. Then we decided an study plan where we, we are going to invest uh, 47 billion in three years. It's a lot. It's a lot. And, and the majority of this investment will be in renewables, around the 45%. And around 55 percent will be in networks in the different countries where we're investing. Then, the, I mean, I would say that 90 percent of this investment are al aligned with the uh, uh, European uh, taxonomy. When you mentioned the, the financing, that situation, I think that is, I mean, that we have done during these uh, 20 years has been investing a lot, but at the same time maintaining the uh, solvency, the financial solvency, the rating, the ratios has been the key for us. Uh, we have had different uh, liquidity crises. We have been, uh, I mean, in moments where the, the, the financing it was not easy. Uh, I mean, uh, investing around 47 billion means that we need to finance, let me say, around 10 billion per year. I mean, there are moments that it's not easy to do that. No? Then, uh, clearly, it's a constraint when we decide to, to do this investment plan to review and to. to to decide this plan, we needed to, to have other uh, sources of financing in order not to penalize the ratio. The ratio, that is because we started to uh, divest 
and also to work with partnership. I mean, we have in this moment we are investing a lot with different uh, non-financial uh, partnerships that are e giving us uh, enough uh, financing in order to be able to, to do this, uh, this investment. No? Uh, we think that, the, I mean, uh, that because we have this strategy, we change. I mean, we see the first uh, green bond in uh, 2014. I mean, today everybody is able to do uh, green bonds, green loans, every different instrument that, uh, that are in the market, that the, the different banks are giving us the opportunity. But in that date, I mean, 2014, it was not so easy. The important thing for me is, the, I mean, to, not only uh, to be able to do green financing, also to, to the diversification. I mean, it's crucial to diversify the source of financing. Not only, I mean, uh, we have a very good relation with the banks, we, we work with a, a lot of banks, but we think that in this kind of uh, uh, investment program, it's necessary to, I mean, to diversify, to finance the group through the capital market a lot. We have probably, we are issuing in different, uh, in the euro market, in the US market, in the in Brazil, in, in Australia, in, in different uh, 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 fishing market. And also it's very, very important to have the, the, the support of the multilateral the development banks, the, the, the ECAs, that in this moment are supporting companies like Iberdrola a lot. I mean, this is crucial in order to be able to do this, uh, this investment plan. All together, near 100% will be, of our investment will be green. Thank you very much, uh, Jesus. Uh, the figures are indeed impressive. You, you were mentioning capital markets uh, um, and, and diversification of, of funding sources. Uh, how do you see the, the investors' appetite for ESG and green um, uh, debt in general? Uh, I, I think that in, in general a lot, uh, a lot. I mean, the, the majority of the, the fishing company investors uh, deciding to invest in sustainable companies, sustainable uh, uh, instruments, exactly the same the, the banks, exactly the same the, the multilateral. I think that it's a very good moment to, I mean, to obtain green financing from this, uh, from this investor. The important thing uh, Nuno mentioned also is the, the green wash, the green washing, and also as always the credibility that we have with the investor. I mean, this is not a, uh, this is the, the, our history. We need to convince the investor. We need to have a credit investor lenders to have credibility, and this exactly that we are trying to do with the, um, our uh, green financing. Uh, I mean, being able to to have a very rigorous framework, following the green bond principle, following the European standard in green bond. I mean trying to do that, but in this moment, I think that uh, I will say all the lenders try, I mean, decide only to invest in green, in green financing. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jesus. Uh, 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 the same questions would go um, uh, to EDP and Juan Pedro. Uh, okay. So basically, uh, what's the, the, the share of uh, green investments yes, within the overall uh, current uh, investment plans of, of EDP? whether or not um, uh, financing is a constraint to pursue uh, these green investments, um, and how do you see the, the, the investors' appetite for ESG slash green uh, debt? Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, and sharing our view. Uh, first of all, we are not so big as Iberdrola. We are doing our best to get there, but not yet. <laughs> uh, uh, the first thing I, I would like to share with you is that this commitment to the green investments on EDP side is, is a decision that was made a long time ago, I can at least more than 10 years ago, where EDP uh, made the decision to start allocating the majority of their investments to uh, the renewable generation and somehow replace, uh, start replacing the, the, the coal generation and also uh, the other thermal generation, namely the natural gas. So um, well, by the end of the last year, uh, EDP went to, like other big uh, the corporates, we went through a uh, um, review and update of our business plan, of our strategy, and it was uh, challenging times. Now we were going through the very difficult, uh, uh, the, the very difficult environment, and uh, 
we, as, as you know, there are, is a long process when we are reviewing our, our business plan, uh, uh, bottom up, top, top down, many things to be reassessed. But end of the day, I believe that what, what is prevailing in our uh, uh, reviewed business plan is that we are convinced that we are going through an unprecedented and uh, structural you know, tailwind uh, uh, in favor of the energy transition. So we believe that although we, we acknowledge and we need to take into account that uh, indeed we are facing um, short term, at least in, on the short term, very challenging uh, um, topics to be overcome, namely the inflation that is eating our cost of capex, uh, obliging us to deploy uh, an higher volume of capex up front, or the interest rates that are going up and making our economics uh, more uh, more difficult as well. But also, uh, there are several execution uh, now uh, um, constraints that we need to overcome uh, uh, in the different regions, either because of the supply chain, although because or, or because of the geopoliticals or taxations or whatever. So, uh, uh, although we we acknowledge. At the end, it was the most important for us was now. We believe that there are a, a movement, there are a support that is, uh, we like to, to say that is a, a, a unprecedented and is, is also structural, that is supporting the, the, the energy transition. And, and we see it in US with the IRA, with the Inflation Reduction Act, but also we see it in the Eurozone with the Repower EU, with the, the Green Deal and so on. So, we are convinced uh, that we're still keeping our pace and, if possible, to ex make some acceleration. And this is what we have made. So we have decided to go for acceleration in our uh, business plan and to increase the, the, the capex that we are aiming to deploy. So from 2023 to 2026, uh, our um, strategic plan is previewing uh, to deploy 25 billion in new investments. And uh, uh, also, we have committed to very, very clear uh, targets. Now, we, we want to be coal-free by 2025. It means that we should not have any generation came from coal plants. Also, we want to be now uh, full green by 20, uh, 2030. So it means that the remaining thermal generation should also be removed from our fleet. So, the, and then, 20, 2040, we should be able to achieve a position of uh, a net zero position. But I believe there are clear targets that uh, uh, we have defined. It. And then we also understand that in order to do it, in order to be able to execute, we need to keep some discipline in on, uh, on, um, as a group. So we need to keep being an investment grade entity. As you know, we have just being re um, very recently uh, upgraded by, by Moody's, something that we are expecting for a while. But we are now triple the flat uh, by all these three main uh, rating agencies. But also we, need, we understand that it means that we need to keep a very balanced uh, net um, funds from operation to net debt. That, okay, we, we want to grow, but we need also to deliver this FFO and also uh, at, at the same time keep uh, delivering some value to our shareholders. Um, therefore, just to give some figures in terms of CapEx, we uh, are now, um, uh, what we will deploy on an annual uh, basis will be above six point something billions per year. 85% um, of that will be for additional renewable generation or also client solutions and, um, and uh, some energy management measures. And the remaining 15% will be for uh, networks. In terms of geographical um, uh, diversity, we are keeping 40% in the Eurozone, 40% in the US, 15% in LATAM. Uh, Brazil is the main country for us in LATAM. And the remaining 5% is in APAC, where we have just entered uh, last year. Also giving you just an idea which are the technologies that we still believe that uh, have more uh, um, uh, 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 more, better economics, let's say, we 40% of that will be on solar utility scale, other 40% will be in wind also uh, um, utility scale, 
12% that is already a, 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 a very significant value will be on DG, uh, solar DG, so distributed generation uh, based on solar panels, and also offshore with 5%, and the remaining, that is 3%, will be in storage and some hydrogen projects as well. When it goes to financing, uh, um, all these 25 billions that I was saying, they, the source of financing are mainly relying not on debt, debt is part of that, but uh, we are relying uh, mainly on our cash flow, that is about 35%. Uh, um, uh, uh, also, uh, something that uh, we have uh, implemented on our company and that we see that there are many other companies also doing the same, that is many projects that we are developing, uh, building and, and putting uh, uh, into operation, we are trying to sell it down in advance, so somehow crystallizing value that we can use to deploy uh, in, in, uh, in, in further projects. So uh, important source of financing is also coming from that. Tax equity, that is a big incentive that uh, the US government is making available for the, the companies that are developing uh, the, uh, the renewable energy in US uh, can benefit of is 12% of our financing, what is quite significant. We have decided to raise additional equity, also is, is something that is, and we were able to execute it uh, already, so it is a decision from the first quarter and already is ex executed with two billions uh, of euros. And then there is a remaining part that is coming from uh, uh, debt that is uh, four, four billions. But I, what I would like to, to highlight is that Debt is very important, but uh, it is more, for a group like EDP, it's more important on the perspective that we keep, that we need to keep our balance sheet, a very strong balance sheet. We need to keep a very strong discipline in order to be able to keep renewing the, 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 the portfolio of debt we have already in our balance sheet renewing it in uh, uh, favorable conditions and quite competitive conditions, and then adding uh, the, the additional debt that we can afford uh, according to the, the growth of our balance sheet. But this is, is, is even more important, you know, this discipline, in order to, keep, to allow us to keep renewing the, 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 the portfolio according to, to, to their, the maturity. Um, then finally, regarding the, the green financing, uh, I be, EDP was not, uh, I believe that companies that were already for a long time doing a strong or a very relevant part of their investments uh, on uh, the green generation, they were more at, at the uh, early beginning at least, they, are, they were convinced that I, I don't need to issue green debt because uh, I'm already green. Uh, I'm, everything I do is green, uh, maybe I, I don't need to, to, to have this label. Uh, uh, so maybe we, we, we take a bit to, to start doing it, but uh, since 2018 that EDP, EDP is issuing uh, um, green bonds. Uh, um, and uh, so from 2018, to up to last year, the only thing that we are doing were, were uh, green bonds. Last year, we did our first sustainment linked facility with two KPIs, um, which were difficult to decide which KPIs we should put on the table because they need to show some ambition, but also we need to be convinced that we will meet the target. And we did, we, we didn't, we didn't, uh, uh, considering all the, 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 the difficulties we, we went through during the, the year uh, of 2022. One of the targets was to reduce our emissions in terms of uh, scope one and scope two, not considering scope three yet, but at least one and two. And there we met, although we, our reduction of CO2, CO2 emissions were lower than what we were expecting because of all the energy crisis we, we were asked to, to collaborate in a, a Iberian effort to keep our, our facilities uh, working for a longer time. But uh, uh, on the other um, KPI that was linked to the, 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 um, the volume of additional capacity, uh, we didn't meet the target. So sometimes 
people are looking to these targets that they are maybe too conservative, but they are not. They are diffi difficult to meet. And as you know, they can have consequences in terms of cost of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of money for, for the companies that are committed to this. These, um, these, these KPIs. So we have already one, uh, one sustainable link facility. We are about to launch a second one this year, but also we have this year already uh, closed our first green loan, an, an SGD, a Singaporean dollar facility, a long-term facility in order to finance our girls in IPAC, and is the third facility. Globally, we have already 48% of our uh, total uh, debt that is sustainable debt, let's say, and uh, what we are aiming to do, and hopefully we will be able to meet it before 2026, is to achieve at, at least 60%. So we are seeing that from the investors, the, the you know, companies or entities that are uh, investing in our debt, we see this appetite, it's, if, uh, each time is, uh, um, um, is more evident that uh, is something that makes difference and that uh, attracts additional investors to our debt. So it's something that we will keep doing and hopefully increase. Thank you very much, uh, Joao. I think uh, that's it. We have, we have uh, exceeded our time slot. Thank you very much to all participants in, that, uh, in this panel. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay. So thank you. So before we go to the next panel, just can do a short summary. So it was pretty enlightening to to hear that from the bank side, um, banks are increasing their awareness to climate risks and not just on the risks per se, but they also work as advisors to their clients. So they collaborate in helping the clients to mitigate the risks. Also, they are changing the assessment of the risks and they are aware of the risks of not doing so uh, because that could lead to tighter financial conditions going forward. Um, and this then feeds also to the information that we got from the corporates, from uh, the ADP and Premier Verdrola, is that not only the, the, um, their funding conditions are linked to the, to the assessment of the banks, but also when they issue green bonds, climate awareness bonds, they, the KPIs are stringent, as we were now reminded by, by ADP. But most of their investment is green, not just now, uh, over for the past 20 years um, in the two cases. And there is uh, an idea that was repeated and was uh, echoes what Professor Nuno Fernandes said in the beginning, is that not even a question of choice. The, the changing to green is not uh, an option for companies, it's query here. Um, so against this backdrop, there is a need to, di to diversify the sources of financing from uh, corporates and also to work together with the banks and with the capital markets to, wish to make sure that the incentives are completely aligned. And uh, last but not least, and this is a good lead for the next panel, there is a, uh, an increasing uh, role of the, uh, for the regulators to step in, not just in terms of setting out the rules, and this is clearly something that we will listen from the, the, the governors of the two central banks that we have here, but then also in terms of the investment from the public sector, and that's why uh, even the, the contribution from the IB is quite relevant, and Ricardo could provide us some, some leads. So, and as with this summary, now passing to the introduction of the next panel, so after hearing the corporates, now we have the policy part. Uh, we have, um, it's, the panel is going to be moderated by Deborah Revotella, the um, director of the economics department at the IB, and we have two central bank governors, Mr. Mario Centeno, Mr. Paulo Hernandez de Cors from Bank of Spain, Mr. Centeno, of course, from the Bank of Portugal, and Ricardo Mourinho Felix, the, one of the vice presidents of the European Investment Bank. So, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Deborah. 
Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Ricardo, and it's uh, really an honor uh, to uh, chair uh, this uh, panel and uh, get, uh, uh, we have uh, so much insight uh, coming out uh, from, uh, from the panelists, uh, so I'm uh, really excited uh, to, to, to be the moderator uh, of this discussion. We were thinking uh, when organizing uh, this uh, joint conference, uh, we were thinking at uh, the topic, uh, of course, is uh, related uh, to investment, but what we were really thinking uh, is uh, how investment, uh, the investment outlook is changing uh, post the pandemic, uh, post uh, the, w the war and uh, the energy crisis, and uh, whether uh, these uh, shocks are coming all together have been a driver for a transformation of the economy toward uh, digital and green. And then also thinking at uh, going forward, uh, what will happen uh, to public investment, uh, private investment, uh, uh, private investment. Uh, we have a lot of concerns uh, related uh, to the effect of uh, remaining uncertainty, tightening a uh, condition, uh, but also the potential future uh, deprioritization of uh, public investment uh, if uh, financial condition become uh, more binding uh, for governments going forward. So that's uh, the context, and I'm very happy, again, uh, to have uh, such panelists uh, in the panel uh, to debate all of this. What we discussed at the beginning uh, was uh, to leave uh, five minutes uh, to each one of you to make uh, the main point, and then we start in a more, uh, more um, interactive uh, way. And uh, I think I would go for uh, first uh, for the... Os ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ricardo to start, thank so you. let it be, thank you. Good. No, thank you very much, good afternoon. Thank you for coming, for joining us, for those here in the room and the, those on live streaming. The topics uh, we delve to here today are not only timely but also crucial in the current global and, uh, and economic landscape. We are discussing two interconnected topics shaping uh, our collective future, the impact of shifting geopolitical landscape on investments, and at the same time, the pace of the green transition with an emphasis in Europe, and because we are here in Portugal, uh, also with the governor of the Bank of Spain in the Iberian <coughs> Peninsula. So we should explore public investment in physical and uh, digital infrastructures. And I'd like to take the opportunity also to thank uh, many of our clients that uh, are in the room uh, from both Portugal uh, and Spain, but all of them and most of them operating outside uh, the peninsula, outside Europe and being global companies as the case of Iberdrola and APDP. So the European Union has committed to achieve the climate neutrality by 2050. That's a very ambitious goal. And this is a cornerstone of the European Green Deal, as you know, and aligns the commitments of Europe with the Paris Agreement. And the green, the green transition is not an oddity anymore, nor even a, just a moral imperative, no. It is now an economic necessity. We are doing this, as Nuno has very well explained, uh, not just for being green or uh, to look uh, good, but because it's economic and financial necessity. We need to do it, and we are facing an existential threat. So we are doing this for the sake of ourselves and for the future generations. And this requires a massive level of investment that can only be met through coordinated public and private sector action. All are needed, all in this room and outside of this room. The companies definitely, the governments, the banks, the insurance companies, the fund managers, the investors, the regulators, and the households. No one can stay out. So we need to combine private and public funding, blending them to financial intermediaries and bringing in the capital markets. This is a massive undertaking. And those who think that public finance will do, you are completely wrong. Public sector is, by itself will never succeed. They don't, the public sector does not have enough resources. So an effective rollout of the project is key. We need to promote the green transition. This requires a massive crowding in of private money so that we can be succeeded. And for this, the capital markets are key. And the capital markets union must move forward. We need this. This will be a quantum leap in the way we manage risks, the way we diversify the risks inside the union, and without a proper capital markets union, we'll be in a very detrimental and difficult position to compete vis-a-vis -vis, uh, United States and other blocks in the world. And to ensure that projects are brought to fruition in a timely manner, we need to streamline procedures and to accelerate implementation. 
First, permitting and licensing processes must be much faster and much simpler. With the processes that we have today, we'll not get there. It simply takes too long. The interplay of public and private investment will be critical for the development and implementation of the strategic technologies. I'm speaking about renewable energy, energy efficiency, recycling, recycling technologies, namely the recycling of critical raw materials that will be key if you want to move from an extractive economy into a sustainable and resilient economy. All the clean tech in a nutshell must evolve, but also strategic technologies related with digital, with artificial intelligence, and with machine learning that are crucial to make the clean tech to operate in an efficient and competitive manner. And such collaboration is key to reduce the dependence of Europe on uh, other blocks. This is particularly true in cases where our manufacturing capacity in the net zero technology value chain relies on single third country suppliers. And Europe must develop an open strategic autonomy by diversifying supplies of critical raw materials, by diversifying supplies and sources of energy, and by diversifying the essential suppliers of manufactured goods. We should not aim at being self-sufficient. Europe will never be able to produce everything that we need in Europe. This will be just a new type of dependency if we move or try to move to outer key. And uh, a dependence from ourselves is better, but not much better than a dependence from a third party. So we must look inwards inside the EU and outside the EU, develop fair partnerships, look at Africa, look at Latin America, that should play a critical role and engage in true partnerships. Partnerships among equals for a resilient global economy that benefit Europe and that benefit our partners too. And in today's geopolitical landscape, fraught with uncertainty and potential risks, the coordination of public and private investment is the key. Governments. Governments need to address the considerable investments required, as well as the necessity of greater mobilization of private funding to meet the respective green targets. However, we know this well, the fiscal space for governments, it's far from unlimited. In fact, it's limited, in particular in countries with high debt levels. And investment tends to be restrained in periods of fiscal consolidation, particularly in the current context where interest rates are increasing and there is a reappraisal of risk by market participants and uh, uh, tightening of credit standards. The recovery and resilient facility is a very important instrument to support public uh, investment. But there are risks of implementation. Risks that stem from the member states absorption capacity, from the short implementation periods that we have in front of us, and from a labor market that is tight and com competencies that are lacking, skills that are lacking in the labor market to address this challenge. One must be aware that the RF was designed in a time <coughs> that it was the time of supporting a green recovery after COVID. RRF was not designed for post-Ukraine invasion time. Against the backdrop of uncertainty and downside risks, it is crucial that public and private investment efforts work together. This should lead to an environment that crowds in private capital through appropriate risk-sharing instruments to foster high-quality investments. Let me turn to physical and digital infrastructures, where it's evident that significant investments will be needed. Hundreds of billions of euros are necessary over the next day, decade to fund green and digital infrastructures. This includes investment in the energy sector, building green energy infrastructure for solar and wind, but also enhancing, improving power grids, improving course border interconnection, storage facilities, and will use gas infrastructures that could be repurposed for hydrogen. Public funding will also play a key role in addressing the digital skills gap, enhancing the digitalization of public services and supporting cybersecurity and infrastructure is critical. The challenges are manifold. Input prices inflation, supply chain disruptions and higher financing costs create an environment for investments that is, to say the least, far from ideal. Despite these challenges, it's clear, it is clear that green and digital transitions stand to benefit from large public policy programs. Yet, fiscal space remains limited. 
Several countries already grappling with these constraints are considering budget neutral policies financed via carbon taxes. But the question that remains is whether this level of public support will be enough for the infrastructure investments that we need to do. Let me, to conclude now, our focus to Portugal and Spain. We see that despite the challenges posed by COVID crisis, firms in Iberia, as uh, presented by Laurent, maintained a good standing with its financial position back to the level registered before the pandemic. So this positive outlook led to a robust, robust recovery in investment, and this also translating into positive investment prospects. The data that we collected from our investment survey indicates that uh, the balance of Portuguese and Spanish firms expecting to increase investments reached a four-year high. However, level of pessimist about the future investment conditions is increasing. Expectations regarding economic climate are taking a downward turn. turn. Availability of external finance is becoming a more important concern for firms in the peninsula. Looking further ahead, the most significant long-term barrier to investment in Iberia are, as revealed by our survey, uncertainty and higher raw material and energy costs. These are complex challenges, but they also present a unique opportunity. They force us to rethink, to reevaluate, to recalibrate strategies for public and private financing and to approach this twin transition. This is an opportunity for us to consider new paths, innovative solutions, and this is a call for action to everyone here today. And uh, I guess the debate, this is the debate we'll be having afterwards. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Deborah, and of course, uh, thank you to, to Mario for hosting us uh, here in, in Lisbon. It's always a pleasure to, to be uh, at the Banco de Portugal. And of course, thank you, uh, Ricardo, for keeping in this uh, conference alive. Uh, you are the, the soul together with Deborah. Um, no, I will, uh, I mean, after listening to, to Ricardo, I have not much to say, no, as, as an introduction. I can agree on basically everything what he, what he said. But let me perhaps put it in a, in a different uh, way, to frame uh, it in a different way. So I see, I mean, the question that you were uh, posing to us, uh, Deborah, is uh, how uh, are we going to finance no, this, um, the investment needs that are needed for, for the challenges ahead. Uh, and I think there are like two elements of the diagnosis that are relevant in order to justify precisely what the, the policy conclusion sh should be. Um, and the elements of the diagnosis that are, for me are relevant are uh, one related to the magnitude and the second on the scope. The magnitude. Uh, I think it's obvious to us when, when, when we read no, all the objectives that we have fixed for, for the European Union as a whole on reducing gas emissions by 55% uh, by uh, 2030, that this has been translated into reducing the share of uh, fuels uh, in, in our uh, uh, energy mix uh, by uh, from 65% to uh, in 2022 to 50% in 2030, and there are several institutions, in particular the European Commission, that has uh, translated these numbers into investment needs. And the investment needs are, 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 are material, are very significant. No, for example, European Commission, in the paper that they published related to this, they, they talk about a number of 520 billion euros per year by uh, 2030, which is close to 4% uh, of uh, 2019 GDP. So it's a, it's a big number, okay? And this is an important consideration that we have to take into account. And then the, the second is the scope, which uh, is, is, for me, is as relevant as the magnitude. Uh, I think we are always talking about European public goods. So if we talk about climate change, it's not that we have to think about Portugal or Spain or, or France or, or, or Germany, but this is something that uh, involves uh, everybody, you know, and uh, on all uh, European uh, citizens. Uh, and the energy transition, and therefore, has to be interpreted in, in this way. No? So we, in the combination of this, uh, the magnitude and the scope is where I draw at least two main policy conclusions. The first one is that uh, we have to think about European resp a, a European response. Uh, and this is uh, for, for good reasons and for bad reasons. For good reasons, I mean, if you are talking about the European public good, this means that if we don't give an European response, the, the main risk is to have an underinvestment. And of course, the bad reason is that if we just uh, uh, fix uh, the, the, the capacity of, uh, of, uh, of uh, every uh, of us to, 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 to cover uh, the, the needs, uh, uh, this will be a condition of our uh, fiscal uh, capacity as well. And th therefore, we might arrive also to a, an, an, uh, an even uh, playing field. So that there are very good reasons for, for good and bad that uh, justify to have this uh, common approach. And for me, it is absolutely obvious, and I guess that later we can talk also about um, 
at the, the SGP and other considerations that can be relevant no, in, the, in, the, in the following years, what I, I think is absolutely crucial, uh, not only because of this, but also ma other macro considerations, what I think is, is relevant and crucial is to have a permanent capacity in order to finance all this, uh, all this investment. And then the second consideration, which is also um, mainly related to the magnitude, I think we cannot think of financing all these needs only with the public sector. So we need, uh, clearly, the private sector. Uh, and in order to do so, there are several requirements that we have to, to cover no, uh, from the European perspective. Well, first one, of course, if we are going to initiate, and we are already initiated a lot of uh, public investment, we need to incorporate also the, the, the private sector and the public-private uh, partnerships. Uh, for example, the EU funds, I think, is a good uh, example of, uh, of, uh, of, of this. But then at the same time, and it was also covered by Laurent in, in, in his pre presentation, that we know that there are a lot of barriers to investment that, uh, that we have to, to fix. Uh, and, and again, it would be uh, important to do it uh, commonly at the European, with the European uh, perspective. And of course, then we have to, to talk in order to, if we want to promote private investment, we have to talk uh, again about capital market union. And of course, we have, cannot forget about the banking, uh, banking union. Because of course, uh, capital market union is obvious. No? The problems uh, here for Europe are, are obvious. Uh, our uh, firms are financed basically or mainly by, by banks. Uh, this means uh, that they are in an inferior uh, situation as compared, for example, to the to US, uh, US uh, uh, non-financial uh, corporates. But it's also that the degree of integration of the capital markets is, is, very, is, very, is very low, and this is also uh, having, of course, negative consequences for the capacity of our firms uh, on, on financing. But I think we should not forget about banking union, because banking union, the fact that we have an incomplete banking union, it, it also creates fragmentation. And uh, again, fragmentation is an impediment to have this common view. And, and the economies of scale that are needed in order to finance uh, this, this investment. So with this initial remarks, uh, I, will, I will stop. Thank, Thank you, you very Lebron. much. And uh, you brought you a <laughs> you, you brought a, a lot of uh, elements. And uh, we will come back. I, I take note. And uh, we will come back uh, with a few points. Uh, but uh, I'll go back. yeah. If you don't mind. Well, thank you again. Um, this is, uh, this is uh, a very rich topic, as uh, both Ricardo's and Paolo's initial um, words uh, already showed. But I want to thank all the panelists uh, so far, and I want to pick a, a few uh, points from, from their presentations to help uh, with mine. I'll focus on Portugal to, to change a little bit. Uh, and, and, and to give you some numbers, but uh, it, is, um, it is quite uh, impressive, as uh, Nuno's presentation showed us, that we've been dealing with this for, for quite some time, and still we have a lot of noise around us. I am especially uh, uh, recalling the, 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 the picture in which we <coughs> see the rating uh, of uh, firms uh, according to the ESG, uh, principles and uh, how, um, how noisy uh, it is. And this is uh, something that worries me because, and I'm going to now pick a, a, a word from, from Jose's presentation, which, which is reputation. Uh, it is quite, quite important uh, for all of us. Uh, while we are discussing investment, sustainability, resilience, reputation is key. Uh, reputation is uh, a synonymous for commitment. And if we don't have commitment from the public sector, from the private sector, from all agents involved, we will be uh, facing uh, greater and greater difficulties in these, uh, in, in these subjects. Because the economy uh, run in cycles. You have usual business cycles, investment is a highly cyclical variable, but then uh, on occasion we have sudden stops. For example, COVID and the pandemic was a stop, a very abrupt stop, stop in our economy. The Portuguese experience is very telling about that. Portugal only converged with the European Union in periods in which investment and exports were the drivers of growth. That's why between 2016 and 2019, just prior to, to COVID, investment and exports were really the drivers of growth. Take the number for, for, for investment. Investment increased 
between 2016 and 2019, 28%. GDP increased 12%, and still we converged during this period every year with European uh, average. External demand was also important. Exports increased twice as much as GDP in this period, 23%. So those were the main drivers for growth for Portugal in, in, in that period. That's probably one of the reasons why in, during uh, the most dramatic times of COVID, uh, 2020, investment in Portugal dropped only by 2.2%. Probably, and this is my interpretation, firms in Portugal uh, understood that it will really be a temporary uh, event, very dramatic but temporary. So investment declined by only 2.2%. It was one, it was actually the, the, the lowest, the smallest drop in investment among countries uh, in, in, in the euro area. And that set the stage for the recovery. And investment started recovering right away in 2021, increased by 8.7%. So we almost very, very fast, we went to numbers higher than, 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 than the COVID um, uh, moment. So uh, the cycle of investment in Portugal is quite important to define the quality and the speed of growth in Portugal a very small economy, open, and quite dependent on these, uh, on these drivers. 2022, and I'm going to go to uh, issues closer to what Pablo just mentioned, 2022 was a little bit uh, of um, uh, a moment uh, in which uh, the Bank of Portugal uh, raised actually the concern that consumption for the first time in many years increased faster than investment. This was quite a bit of a, a problem for the Portuguese economy if it is to continue. And the most recent numbers show that it will not continue. And we, we now project and we have been observing again investment and exports to take the lead in terms of growth. So 2023 and the following years uh, are critical, are critical because we need to return to growth financing practices, investment must recover, and why, why is that? Well, first of all, because convergence with the EU will only happen if investment takes the lead. Second, because Portugal is undergoing what I've been calling the silent revolution, the share of higher education uh, workers in our uh, population, especially among the young cohorts, more than doubled in 20 years. This silent revolution takes more than 40 years to complete. We are still halfway. This is a huge investment. It is sustainable. It, 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 it improves the resilience of the economy. It can't stop. And we all must take care uh, uh, of that. So we need to create conditions for demand, for labor demand, to come and match this increased supply uh, of labor. But of course, green and digital transitions are with us. They require investment. They are not a consequence of COVID. They were already in 2019, the two main pillars of the program of the new commission. We were already taking care of that. We need to accelerate this. But transitions in economy, especially structural transformations, they need time. They take time, and we need to find that time. And you know that in, the, in, the, in an economy, time means liquidity, and liquidity means capacity to finance uh, all agents in the economy. So that's why this is so central to, to, to all of us. We have challenges, uh, of course. Uh, we, we will never have the ideal conditions that uh, Ricardo uh, alluded to. We are, as I mentioned in my first intervention today, uh, in a process of uh, monetary tightening. Monetary tightening will be with us for quite some time. It will not go away uh, as fast as all of us would, 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 would like. So we need to understand that we are coming back to normal interest rates. 
the 2020, 2019, 2018 interest rates were by that definition abnormal. So we need to understand that and we need to take that very uh, much in our uh, investment uh, plans. In Portugal, again, the situation is much better than, say, before the, the great financial crisis. Why is that? Because Portuguese firms, as much as households, they leverage. We have now an, um, um, a share of uh, debt over GDP that is below the euro area average. And this is something new and novel for, for, for Portugal, and we need to take, to take advantage of that. Otherwise, and just to finalize, I totally agree with what Pablo says about the fiscal dimension at the euro area level. It is a must complete the banking union, expand the capital markets union also for all the reasons that, that, that he mentioned. But let me uh, finalize with a, a word uh, of concern uh, and, and uh, uh, that I'd like to, to, to send also because of this idea of reputation and how markets work. Because everything that we do and uh, we were introduced as uh, decision makers, I think it was like that, Deborah, something like that, yeah? <laughs> so yes, we are. Uh, me and Pablo every six weeks, more or less, right? Uh, but uh, uh, we need to, 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 um, to rely in markets that work. And for markets to work, there's one thing that we need to see, which is translated in, that, in those market outcomes, the main shocks that we see uh, around us. And that's one that, that concerns me. The inflationary process was the result of shocks exogenous to the euro area economy, coming from energy, coming from supply restrictions uh, that already also uh, Ricardo alluded to, coming from the war. We see today a big reversion of these shocks. Take just a few numbers. TTF gas, the natural gas that, that, that we use in Europe, it's, the price is falling 68.5% year on year today. It is already below the maximum level of prices that we observed during 2018 and 2019. We need to see this in our HICP, in our consum consumer prices uh, uh, outcomes. Most construction and industrial goods, iron, steel, aluminum, zinc, nickel, you name them, they are all falling at least 25% year on year, and they are, all of them, with the exception of nickel, falling compared with the prices prevailing in 2018 and 2019. We need this to, this to be reflected in, the, in prices. So we need markets to work. Otherwise, our life will be made much more difficult, both for monetary, for investors, for, for predictability of all uh, the outcomes in our economy. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you very much. So, I think we had a lot of elements to reflect and a good, uh, good overview of the situation in, uh, in, uh, in the different countries at the European level in Spain and Portugal. I would like to focus on a number of topics, macro area, the discussion going forward. And maybe the first point is, uh, and I know that the governors don't like to speak about the fiscal, but I go on the, <laughs> <laughs> I go on the, on the, yeah, on the fiscal side, uh, partially, no, no, um, talking about the public investment. So what we know about the public investment, uh, looking at the European level, is uh, that every time uh, that uh, there is a, a period of fiscal consolidation, uh, there is a deprioritization of public investment. And now we know that uh, uh, the, the temporary exemption of the fiscal rule is uh, coming uh, and uh, the new fiscal framework is coming. And also in the new fiscal framework, uh, the correction, the allowed correction for, uh, for investment uh, seems to be relatively weak. 
Uh, on the other side, uh, we have another element uh, that is coming up, the fact uh, that uh, we still have the recovery and resilient facility, and we see in some countries uh, the absorption capacity seems to be the real binding constraint. So the, the capacity to deliver projects, particularly on the digital and green on the public sector. On uh, Europe overall, but also on the single countries, so what, are you, what is the, the main concern that you have on public investment, on uh, public investment going on? Are you concerned uh, that uh, we will see a massive decrease uh, going forward, or do you think that uh, there will be opportunities and uh, what uh, should be really done uh, to keep it going? And uh, I don't know, maybe Pablo, oh, no, we can, start from start. you and uh, well, you, Mario. You've you mentioned many topics, but let me try to, <laughs> to at least uh, uh, tackle some, some, some of them. Um, starting with, maybe with fiscal, no? um, well, monetary policy makers, we are always talking uh, on, on fiscal issues, even more than on monetary. <laughs> I have some, sometimes the feeling. No, uh, I think that you are completely right, and the numbers for, for Spain that were shown uh, before uh, by, by Logan were quite, um, were quite telling. Um, the public investment over GDP in Spain before the global financial crisis was very high. Uh, then, of course, uh, public debt increased uh, very significantly during the global financial crisis. Also, the structural deficit increased uh, a lot. And uh, the main uh, variable uh, of, of adjustment was uh, public uh, investment. And the reality is that even before the, the, the pandemic, the level of uh, public investment in Spain was close to 2%, which, according to the estimates of, uh, of, the, of the Banco de España, they, they were simply enough uh, to, to cover the amortization of uh, our public uh, capital, the, the stock of, of, of capital, which uh, means that it was really, really very low. No? And incompatible, let's say, with all the uh, financing needs and investment needs that we were mentioning in, in, the, initial, in the initial remarks. Um, so I think we all agree uh, here that uh, fiscal rules are, are necessary, in particular in the European Monetary Union, to guarantee fiscal sustainability. But, uh, uh, of course, uh, we have to define these fiscal rules uh, also co compatible with, uh, uh, with uh, other macro uh, objectives. Uh, I think uh, my personal view is that the proposal made by the European Commission is a good starting uh, point. From an analytical point of view, I think many uh, academic uh, um, people, but also uh, policymakers in general, have been defending this uh, anchoring of the fiscal rule on, on public debt plus uh, an expenditure rule. This is, this is there. Of course, operationalizing this won't be easy, but I think the, is, is, uh, the, 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 the fact that it is in the, in the proposal of the European uh, Commission, I think, is very good. As you mentioned, in terms of the conversation that we are having here, perhaps the most important element is the fact that uh, the proposal is for uh, allowing uh, countries uh, to, to extend the consolidation period if uh, and when there are material investment uh, um, uh, commitments and structural reforms uh, uh, made by, by countries. And of course, here, what it is important, as, as usual, uh, the devil is in the detail. No? Whether, how uh, we are going to be uh, in a position to uh, assess ex ante whether these uh, investment uh, opportunities are the ones that we, the, that we want, uh, and of course the structural reforms that contain the details that we also want to improve the, the potential of growth of our, our economies. And of course, it will also be very relevant to guarantee that it's post, you know, that uh, there are also the, the incentive mechanisms uh, for, for these reforms and investments to, 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 be, to be done. But I think, in my personal view at least, it's a, it's a good, uh, it's a good uh, starting point. Then you were mentioning the delays no, on the implementation of, uh, of uh, and you, and you funds. Well, I think we shouldn't be surprised on, on this. No? And uh, there is a, the, a lot of analysis that uh, were done on the absorption capacity of countries, not of course of the NGU, but of previous uh, structural funds. Uh, and the reality, for example, in the Spanish case, at, uh, is that I mean, the absorption capacity at the end of the programs uh, is, is relatively high, above 90%. But uh, always with a delay. So the, the last years are absolutely crucial in order to increase this absorption capacity. I mean, in, uh, and in, in this regard, I've always been uh, emphasizing in Spain that in this trade-off that uh, it always exists no, between uh, doing things quickly and doing it uh, uh, well. Uh, I'm always in, in, the, in the second, <laughs> in the second, in the second camp. No? And, uh, and here we have to take into account that the magnitude of the funds are very, very significant. So, for example, we are talking about 12% of, uh, of GDP if we combine the transfers and the, and the loans. I mean, this is equivalent to all the money that Spain has re received through structural funds since, the, since, since uh, Spain entering into, into, European, into European Union. So we are, we are talking about a big, big, big size. Uh, and then, of course, is the complexity. Because it's not that we want simply 
to increase uh, uh, growth on the short run. No, we want trans to transform our economies. And this is why we have uh, combined um, this uh, investment with uh, the, the, the need for countries to do structural reforms. And doing structural reforms is complex. Defining them is complex, implementing them is, is complex. And this is why what we are defending at the, at the Bank of Spain level is that uh, we need, uh, it would be wise to extend the deadlines so that we guarantee that the money is, is spent wisely. Uh, and um, for me, that will be the, the, main, uh, the main message to, to, to Julian at this, uh, at, this, uh, at this stage. So, but let me now stop and, <laughs> and let the others to, to tackle the other issues. I, 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 can, I can totally subscribe to, to what Pablo said, virtually. Uh, so let me head, because my experience is a little bit more richer than, than, than Pablo's in terms of public investment. Uh, so uh, I, can, I can be a little bit more cautious. Uh, about it. Uh, we, we need to understand uh, that, um, uh, for example, in Portugal, we end up paying roads in which we will never travel. And that was public investment. We have stadiums that are empty, and it is public investment. So we became much more selective, much more demanding with the concept uh, of, of, of public investment, and I think it was very right, uh, that, that movement. Uh, so we need, we need to understand that uh, we, we need to very carefully plan, implement, execute public investment, and that's why it takes so long, short of parliamentary commissions that then at the end of the road sometimes also take us a little bit of a toll here in Portugal. So we need, we need to be demanding and that's what we are right now and I think it's good, it's a very good development. I think uh, we need to, uh, to, to use the, the funds precisely as, as Pablo's, uh, Pablo said, uh, I, uh, I was highly involved in the first stages uh, of that debate in Europe, and since that moment, I was saying exactly what Pablo said here, we have to look carefully at the horizon of implementation of, of these funds. It was very obvious since the beginning that, that we will be facing this. And, and this is even more important for Europe because these funds represent the, the, the first time Europe uh, issued a common asset a safe asset in euros to finance as a supranational uh, asset these, these, these funds. And these represent way more than the money that is devoted uh, to, these, to, these, to these funds in terms of the financing conditions uh, of euro. And it is a very important uh, element in, in the resilience also uh, of the euro area. Uh, these, the, these days through these very difficult times because the war is in Europe, because there are uh, uh, countries in the Euro area that are neighbor to, to, to Ukraine that, 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 that is facing the war. So we need to be very, very uh, also demanding from the side of, 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 uh, of the European authorities uh, in, in, in this respect and be open to, to, to this. From the country perspective, uh, we uh, uh, we need to speed up the execution as much as possible without a further uh, delay. As I uh, usually mention, uh, unfortunately, 80% of all public sector investment uh, is still financed via taxes, not European funds in Portugal. This is something that uh, for Quite some time I've been pushing <laughs> uh, or trying to push <laughs> to, for it to, to change. Uh, and and uh, the country needs really to concentrate uh, on that, but being very demanding on the way we do it. And uh, Ricardo, maybe on your side also, on this absorption capacity, what yeah. can we do as an institution as well? Well, um, first, uh, on uh, what is said about public investment, I, as you can imagine, I subscribe to the issue of uh, more important than the quantity is the quality of yeah. investment. And uh, that's uh, what we push for at the bank. It's uh, not about just volumes in billions of euros dropped on problems, but uh, about 
having solutions that mean something for the people, what we call additionality, what we call the impact, and what we assess as the impact of investments. So the way I see that uh, EIB can play and is playing already a very important role uh, in uh, implementation, increase in absorption capacity, is precisely in having uh, partnerships with, uh, with, uh, with the member states. We already work with some of them. We are planning to work with some others. Uh, but uh, what can we bring in this respect is precisely what Mario and Pablo just said. We can bring uh, deep due diligence where we assess the viability, the sustainability of projects, not only from a financial perspective, if uh, we, can see, uh, we can see the money back of the era or if RF loans can be paid back, but also from an economic perspective, if the investment generates the value added and uh, the impact in the private sector that create resources uh, that can pay for this investment over time and that do not become uh, what uh, I think Mario was describing as stages and empty roads which is our definition of stranded assets. So assets that you produce and that do not deliver the service and hence becomes not an investment but a pure spending for the society because it doesn't have any return. That's what we bring. That's how I think we can add value. Uh, on RRF and timing, I alluded that in my introductory remarks. RRF was created back in 2020 during a long night in April with other instruments uh, from an idea of uh, fiscal capacity for the euro area that uh, then uh, was just born as a very small thing. Then COVID came and everything that was impossible during two years became possible on that night in April. And that's how RRF then was created as something to give and to provide, to, to provide a green and sustainable recovery after COVID. Then the war came. And the war changed, again, the table. It brought back supply-side driven inflation, further disruption of uh, supply chains. I think that we need to look at our RF and uh, what you described as time to breed. We need to have time for our RF to breed. We need to implement the reforms. But uh, if we keep pushing for doing in a very short time a huge amount of investment, we are fueling inflation and we are most likely not doing necessarily the best investments, but the ones that we can deploy faster, which are not necessarily those that will have bigger or, uh, or larger impacts in potential output. And I think that's the aim, to impact potential output, having a more efficient economy. And uh, time is needed to do that. Very good, and uh, I think uh, the, then uh, I switch from public investment uh, to private investment. And uh, two things uh, come out uh, that uh, to me remain striking. On the one side, uh, the corporate sector uh, generally in Europe uh, came out uh, very well from uh, the series of shock that we had. Uh, so uh, in fact, I think uh, we are all surprised uh, from uh, low MPL and waiting uh, MPL uh, to deteriorate, but uh, it doesn't happen. In fact, uh, what we also see is uh, that uh, the corporate sector seems to have uh, uh, quite uh, some uh, repricing power coming up. Uh, I assume as governors uh, that uh, you must be worried uh, on the inflation. Uh, point of view, but as investment, that, that should be a driver for investment. It means uh, companies that remain profitable and they, they, they could invest more. What is uh, the rule of uncertainty that is uh, still in the system uh, coming up uh, and uh, constraining investment? What, uh, what is uh, your concern? How do you see this situation, uh, the combination uh, between uh, the uncertainty on the one side, uh, the good balance sheet of corporate, uh, and the tightening of financing condition? So, I can start. Okay. <laughs> this time, just for a change. We, um, we, we still don't quite understand very well um, the, the, what is behind the uh, better than expected uh, performance of the economy uh, since the recovery uh, from COVID uh, started. Uh, there are, nevertheless, a few reasons that uh, I can add that are connected with what you, Deborah, just said um, to, 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 the, to, to the good situation in which we are today, despite the financial tightening that uh, already occurred. And, and these are uh, related with the, 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 the good conditions that we had prior to COVID, 
there are two numbers that I think are important. Uh, there was a quite significant deleveraging in the most vulnerable countries in Europe, namely Portugal. I just mentioned one figure. There's another one which is related with, with public finances as well. 14 out of the 19 member states of the euro area at the end of 2019 were at what we call the medium term objective, which is a safe harbor for public finance given the challenges on debt, uh, aging, education, health costs. It, it's a very demanding condition to be in, believe me. And 14 out of the 19 member states of the Eurozone were by then in these conditions. And during COVID, we did what we were supposed to, to do as a union. I already mentioned the safe asset and the reaction of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of Europe uh, altogether. The ECB was part of that, of that answer. Ricardo touched upon that as well. But at the micro level, both firms and households did exactly what was expected, especially in Portugal. For the first time ever, in the context of a crisis, families and firms increased their savings. It never happened before in Portugal, never. We are, we, today, we have a lower level of net debt in Portugal for families and firms than in 2019. So the accumulation of deposits and savings was m greater than the, 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 the one with that. Who paid for this? The state. Public administration. That's why we need to be very careful about the conditions that we ask public administration. Ricardo alluded to that at least four times that I counted, maybe more. <laughs> uh, and, and that's very important because we need to keep this balance to promote sustainability and resilience uh, to the future. So. The, these are the, the ingredients that I can identify that uh, help me to explain why the economy is doing so well in very difficult, dif difficult situation. Uh, but still, uh, I am surprised every time a number comes. <laughs> Pablo, can you help me? Uh, no, not, uh, no. <laughs> I, think, I, mean, I think we need to be prudent no? because um, as, as, as Mario uh, said, no, it, it is there, it, there was a, a, a structural improvement in the in the financial situation uh, of the private sector in, in in our countries. Portugal is one one example. Spain is, is another. No, it, I mean the decline of um, of private sector debt in Spain uh, was uh, above 60 percentage uh, points of uh, of GDP. Uh, since the start of, uh, of the global financial crisis. I mean, it's a big number, 40% uh, non-financial uh, non corporates, 20% uh, households. So um, competitive net gains also were very significant. This led also to a current account surplus where we have been able to keep this uh, surplus during, even during the last uh, three years under very difficult uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and these are, of course, uh, very uh, positive news. As you were mentioning, I mean, the, the evolution of markups uh, during the, um, the last two years has been, has been good. Um, we have, uh, and, the, and the, the financial situation of our companies is, uh, is better than, than expected, but I, I think at the same time we have to, to emphasize that a good part of it is because of the public sector support also during, mm -hmm. during the crisis. Um, when I uh, mentioned that I think we need to be prudent, it's also that the fact that there is, uh, first, a lot of heterogeneity across sectors and in part even within sector and, and you see even with you analyze uh, markups so the, the average markup uh, I, don't, I, I don't i don't think it, it's very revealing of any of any of anything uh, also because um, we have also some some experience in spain it was the case in many countries during the global financial crisis but it's again the case now that uh, we also uh, mm, try to interpret uh, the increasing markups as a, as a good thing and sometimes the increasing markups is simply showing a financial vulnerability of companies. It's like the, the last uh, option that they have in order to, to survive. So, and and the, uh, we, we our, our staff also did some estimates of, of these correlations. And again, in this time, this, they showed that uh, in, in some cases that the correlation was, 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 was positive. No? 
Uh, and then, um, uh, very much uh, related to what uh, Mario said in, in his introduction, uh, I mean, I think there are two elements that are here to stay. One is uncertainty. I mean, of course, perhaps not the degree of uncertainty on, on which we are living uh, today, no? but that there are these geopolitical considerations uh, that I don't think they are going to vanish uh, from one day to, to the other and are going to affect us uh, for, 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 uh, for, for, the, for the next years. And then, of course, the second is financing conditions. That's the, that's, the, that's, the, that's the reality. I mean, I, I don't really know what the R star, the natural interest rate is, uh, no? but uh, just look at the market. The market is now um, uh, thinking about a, a long-term interest rate uh, for, for Germany of uh, above uh, 2% when it was uh, neg in negative numbers just three years ago. So it seems that the market is expecting that the financial conditions are going to be uh, tighter for, for, for longer, and this is going to also affect the, the financial, the, the investment capacity of, of, our, of, our, of our firms. So, so I think we need to, to have this, uh, this balanced view. And, and of course, for example, when we publish our financial stability report, we always do these exercises, uh, simulations on what the consequences of the, of the current uh, um, uh, financing conditions will, ha will be, will have on, the, on, on our uh, non-financial corporates. And you see that there the, the will be an increase in the vulnerability of our firms. Um, so this is the environment in which we, we are going to live, and, and then at the same time, the, the fiscal, the room for manoeuvre on the fiscal side has diminished uh, very, very significantly. So uh, we cannot expect also the public sector be, be being there. On the, on the, on the contrary, in the, in the Spanish case, uh, what we are advocating is for uh, starting fiscal consolidation already, already now. So all this gives uh, a mix uh, pictures, and uh, there are some structural uh, elements that have gone in the, in the in the right direction, but there are others that. Uh, um, will go in the, in the opposite uh, direction, and so I think we have to, to have a prudent uh, approach here. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> let me start from why the economy looks so good and why we entered into left or we came out uh, in such a good situation. Well, in fact, I think that both Portugal and Spain did a quite impressive job before COVID came. And uh, fortunately, this time, Europe learned from previous mistakes and didn't, they have not done the same that in the financial mm -hmm. crisis and put uh, all these uh, safety nets uh, during COVID period. And this left to the result that we used to look at US and say, wow, these guys do great things. They put a lot of money and they sustain the economy in a crisis. We did the same. We sustained the economy. We preserved jobs. We preserved the companies. We supported households. And then we came out of the crisis in a much better situation. I think the question now is, and, and what's next? How to look forward? And uh, looking forward, having the companies in a good condition, the key issue now is how to foster investment and innovation. And uh, in a context which is, as a sh some features of the crisis, high inflation and uh, uh, some subdued growth for a period, but we have a very strong and tight even labor market, and we need to look how to do investment, how to implement the RRFs. Well, in this respect, I think uh, there, are, there is the need for uh, uh, Europe to face this issue and to look how to create the instruments for innovation. The IB can do a lot. We are doing, I think, a lot with, uh, with the IF and uh, through the, this European Tech Champion Initiative. We are moving companies and providing them the equity for firms to move to the next level. But I think that uh, the mid-term mid review of the MFF is a key opportunity to look at uh, the sovereignty fund. And if you want, in fact, to have a strong European economy that then competes at global scale, uh, we should look uh, at this IRA not just as a threat, uh, but uh, as putting public funds to fast forward the green transition and the digital transition. And Europe must look at that. If you speak with the most of our clients that operate, that have operations in the US, what they say is that IRA has a big advantage. It's extremely simple to understand and to benefit from it. Unfortunately, in Europe, we have much more complex schemes. I think we need to make this simple. I think we need to have a, a, a sovereignty fund that at the same time puts at the service of uh, economies the funds needed and ensures level playing fields. If we don't have the sovereignty fund, if we just create yet another um, state aid framework, we'll allow countries that have deeper or larger fiscal space to support the companies more than those that are more restrained. This will not create a level playing field and risks even to destroy the internal market. 
And uh, I think that will be a big damage. So having a strong sovereignty fund, uh, it's the way for having Europe together investing and moving to the next stage and being able to compete with the US, to compete with other blocks, but also to work together with other blocks at a similar level and not as a uh, block that is always running behind the curve. We have a leadership in clean tech. If we don't invest in it, we can lose it. And uh, that's not something that uh, Europe uh, deserves. I think uh, then uh, I, I may ask uh, your opinion on, uh, on the sovereignty fund, uh, um, but also, Another point, uh, talking about uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the, and the all everything that uh, uh, came around that, there is uh, one point uh, I think uh, where at the European level maybe we are a bit uh, disillusioned by now, but uh, the, the, the point of the value of the single market. I remember when I was a student uh, uh, age ago, there was always uh, this way of uh, calculating the cost of non-Europe, it was called. So the, f the fragmentation of the market that, uh, that uh, add the cost uh, uh, in terms of efficiency, in terms of uh, market potential uh, and uh, affecting companies. And we see now, particularly on the green transition, a lot of impediment coming up uh, um, in terms of, uh, I don't know, different standards uh, in uh, the, in, uh, the uh, in approval of certain product, uh, then the complexity in, uh, uh, in implementation, etc. How do you see the potential of uh, having a new agenda on the single market? It's also the anniversary, I think, of <laughs> the single market coming. Do you think that's uh, as a priority and uh, again uh, fighting uh, uh, against uh, this uh, barrier to investment uh, at the nitty gritty level uh, or, uh, or not? And maybe we start from you. Okay, no, start from me. <coughs> How to promote the single market? I think that uh, the way to promote the single market is precisely to have EU-wide instruments that can provide funding to all entities in the EU uh, under the same conditions. Given that uh, we are still quite far from having a capital markets union, uh, <coughs> banking union uh, keeps being uh, discussed uh, at the uh, European level uh, now for at least. Uh, 10 years, but we still have uh, how many years behind 60. US? 60. 60 years behind US and some hundreds of amendments. Uh, there is still hope. Given that we are in this situation and uh, this will take time, uh, the way to move this is first to have European institution. EIB, I think it's a key player in this respect because we offer our products to all the countries under the same conditions, under state aid compliant rules as a condition. So we, uh, this allows us to put on the market every year 60 to 70 billion euros, given uh, the standard multipliers we work with. This allows to mobilize uh, something that is around 300 billion euros of investment uh, per year. So it can be uh, very important. But then I think we need to have another leg. And that's where the sovereignty fund comes, to have a leg that allows for blending, for using budgetary resources to, in a sense, create uh, conditions, either by grant, uh, providing grants to the projects or technical advisory to move projects that are very innovative from pre-bankable stage to bankable stage, such that we can scale them up and make them more, uh, uh, make them <coughs> practical. I think this will be key when we discuss, and the discussion is coming every day more about critical raw materials. Critical raw materials, we discuss how to do it. Shall we do it in Europe or shall we go and uh, mining all over the world and then bring resources here? I think this discussion will not go much far if we take the extractive model, because the extractive model is what other blocks, in particular China, is doing, is taking the lithium from wherever refine it in China and produce more. I think we need to develop a different model where we develop partnerships, where we develop the mining and refining and doing it inside or outside Europe. Then we need to have recycling capacity and we need to scale up recycling such that we may extract for 10 years, but then we can simply keep the market by recycling materials and enter into a more sustainable mode. That's something that requires a huge amount of investment. The same applies to hydrogen. We need to scale up the technology such that uh, the average price per uh, kilowatt or per joule 
comes lower and that we can use it at industrial level and make it competitive. That's the challenges that we face. And uh, for a question of competitiveness, we need to have uh, the internal market working and we cannot allow simply that uh, war trade by others destroy the internal market. Yeah, maybe uh, on the Inflation Reduction Act, not that you were uh, also mentioned. How I see things on, on this. So, for me, I mean, it was uh, obvious in, in all interventions, not uh, in, uh, only in this panel, but in previous panels, is that I mean, uh, we are all justifying um, the need for uh, public intervention in order to, to fight against climate change. That's obvious. And there, there are different instruments to do so. One is public investment. The second is taxation. But an, another one is subsidies, which is simply negative taxation. Mm. Okay, and uh, well, different jurisdictions could uh, choose uh, different choices. Um, I was justifying in my initial remarks uh, today that at the European level, precisely in order to avoid an, an, uh, an even playing field, also the fact that uh, since this is a, um, a global or at least an European uh, public good, we need to, to do it in a, in, a, in a unified way. Okay, but probably you can argue that uh, this should be also the, the case at the global at the global level. Of course, I'm not so naive as to, um, as to uh, be in a position to, to defend that we uh, will have a, a possibility, even a, a very low pro probability of having been, uh, this done at the, a complete unified level, at the global level. But at least to have some kind of coordination, uh, I think, is, is, re is relevant. And again, uh, I think uh, this is another argument to justify the, the multilateralism that we've always defending from the European perspective. So I, I don't think there is a... Uh, uh, an avenue that it's optimal, uh, not even uh, a second degree of uh, optimality uh, to try to, to fight one uh, once against uh, each other on this, trying to gain competitiveness through uh, different instruments. So I think this coordination uh, should be absolutely uh, key if we want to succeed uh, and, and of course if we want to do it in, a, in an optimal way. Yeah, let me, let me be a little bit more conceptual. Me and Pablo are here in a, we are in a kind of a disadvantage with Ricardo because the only product that we have is to increase interest rates, which makes everyone's life difficult. He is selling products every time. I mean, every time he speaks, he has a new product, a new solution for investment to make this easier, and it works. <laughs> so I'm going to be conceptual this time, so, so that to see if I can, can gain some attention and answer your question on the single market. You, you know, the, to me, the history of, uh, of the European Union and all this uh, amazing construction uh, that we have, political one, in Europe is, is, can be described as follows. W when we first uh, entered this journey, we were all very much excited. Uh, integration was not much. And moral hazard and mistrust was also low. I mean, those were not concerns. As we moved along the way, integration increased, and we were, and we are, in a very incomplete setting. We have the single market, we have the banking union, but it's not complete. We don't have a fiscal capacity, but we have a safe asset. We have a treasury, but we don't have a budget. I mean, it's really kind of complex. But at this moment, we are at the highest. We, we were at, uh, because I think we have already <laughs> made uh, some way <laughs> forward. We were at the highest of uh, mistrust and moral hazard concern. Integration was already kind of large, not large enough, and we were looking at each other and kind of mistrusting uh, each other. I mean, sentences like the one that Ricardo had to reply about uh, the, the southern habits uh, in terms of drinking uh, is, is a big example of that. So, and we made progress. It was in a very difficult moment, but we did make progress. And I think if integration continues, these moral hazard concerns and mistrust will continue to go down because we feel safer in a much more integrated setting than in this middle of the road thing in which we think we control, but then we don't. Uh, we think we can share, but then we don't. So, you know, this is a kind of an inverse M-shaped relationship, and Europe needs to move to the other extreme of this relationship with more integration, more trust among uh, all uh, our uh, nations, because Europe is a, a construction of nations, and, and we need to move towards that. If you do, 
then the single market for sure will be, can be reinforced, banking union can be completed, the private joke that Ricardo was mentioning was very simple to tell. In the US, for them to have the FDIC, it took them 70 years of fight uh, among the states and 150 proposals to Congress to complete the FDIC. The European Deposit Insurance Scheme that we all complain about not having yet uh, is still very young in this debate, so that's why we, we can have still 60 years <laughs> of, of, of debate and not, uh, and not lagging behind the, the, the US in terms of how, how long it takes to do it. I think it, it's going to be much faster, that's my expectation, but we need to, to, to move on in, into, the, into this curve, you know, because the, the more integrated we are, the, the smaller will be the concerns regarding moral hazard and mistrust. Uh, risk reduction is very important, I, I, I mentioned that before. We were at, a, at the highest level of risk reduction in 2019. That's why the integration leap that we observed in 2020 was possible. Otherwise, it would have been much more difficult to, to come up with, with the solution we presented to COVID. And, and this is where we are now. So I think we will continue in this process. That's a, I think it's a, it's a perfect uh, uh, end of time uh, and uh, uh, positive uh, conclusion. Uh, I am uh, very in, optimistic uh, always. That's why Pablo is worried about me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think uh, it would be great if uh, really the, the, even uh, the net zero transition uh, of the economy can be a driver for this uh, further integration. Sure. And I think uh, I, I would uh, conclude the discussion of this uh, fantastic panel, uh, very, uh, very much uh, thanking uh, the, uh, my panelists uh, and uh, thanking uh, everybody who has been uh, joining uh, today, both uh, online and uh, particularly those uh, that made it uh, uh, physically to uh, here with us. Um, so thanks a lot uh, and uh, uh, hope that we can continue the tradition uh, then uh, next year, uh, either, uh, I don't know if it's again uh, Spain or uh, Portugal or Luxembourg, uh, we or will see. Or in the border. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much uh, to everybody. <laughs>